Hey, want to get rich? We know a place you can go, but there's a story you need to hear first. In 1988, the SCP Foundation's automated econometric anomaly prediction systems picked up some unusual activity in Huaxi Village in the People's Republic of China following Deng Xiaoping's economic reforms. Compared to the rest of the country, Hua Xi Village, in particular, was experiencing extremely rapid earnings growth and an increase in investments. This prompted additional investigation of the village. Foundation agents sent to the area were surprised by what they found there. For once, the surprise was not unpleasant. Hua Xi Village was an unusually peaceful place, one of economic prosperity mixed with equality where all of the people worked together and everyone's needs were met. The village was operating in complete social cohesion and perfect harmony. That alone would not have been enough to keep the foundation there, but there was something else that kept their eyes on Huashi Village, something strange. Whenever they went, whoever they spoke to, foundation personnel kept hearing about the same man over and over again. Whoever he was, he was beloved by the entire village, who attributed their way of life to his help. But there was one problem. As far as the Foundation could tell, this man did not exist. Foundation agents embedded within the Chinese central government combed official records, but found no evidence of the man described. No birth certificate, no employment records, nothing. And yet, people continued to sing his praises, describing the brilliant, generous, kind man who had led them to prosperity. The phenomenon left Foundation officials scratching their heads. Was the man some sort of shared delusion? It seemed unlikely, but whatever the case was, they needed to get to the bottom of it. During their initial investigation, the Foundation planted several CCTV mm -hmm. cameras throughout the village so they could monitor the residents and observe their behavior when they were alone and without outsiders. What they saw on the video feed only raised more questions. CCTV footage from inside Chuashi Village showed the residents talking to themselves, conducting whole conversations with an invisible entity. The voice of the other person, if there was one, could not be heard. This phenomenon did not stop with one-on-one -on -one conversations either. Assemblies and town meetings occurred where dozens of people gathered to listen to a speaker except no one walked up to the podium. The crowd would sit, occasionally laughing, clapping, or cheering for upwards of an hour, before leaving all at once, as if dismissed. <laughs> Foundation researchers began to develop a theory. If this was not indeed a shared delusion, then there must have been an entity that only residents of Huashi Village could see and interact with. There was only one way to know for sure. A Foundation agent would need to become an official resident of Huashi Village. Agent Cheng was selected for the job and was provided with a house in Huashi Village, purchased with allocated Foundation funds. His official documentation was modified to reflect his new address and identify him as a resident of the village. He packed up his things and moved into his new house. He had just finished unpacking when he heard a knock at the door. He opened the door to find an elderly man standing on the other side. The man greeted Chang warmly and introduced himself. It was the same name Chang and the rest of the Foundation had been hearing all over the village. He could see the famous benefactor that everyone was raving about. Agent Chen introduced himself in kind, and the elderly man told him that he had been expecting a new resident to move into the village. He had known that someone had been watching him ever since the CCTV cameras were installed, and knew that it would only be a matter of time before whoever was watching him moved someone into the village to get a closer look at things. He asked Agent Chen who he was working for. Chang, remembering his training, maintained a look of perfect innocence and said that he had no idea what the man was talking about. The man chuckled indulgently, like someone might in the face of an obviously fake story told by a young child, and handed Chang a business card. He expressed an interest in speaking with Chang further and left. Chang took the business card to his superior, Dr. Wang, who advised him to meet with the man. So, Agent Chang found himself at the address listed on the business card, equipped with a hidden microphone for the purpose of recording the conversation. He was greeted by the mysterious old man, who poured each of them a cup of tea and gestured for Chang to sit down across from him. I am not surprised that you have come back to see me, he began. Are you now willing to tell me who you work for? The central government, I'd imagine. Agent Chang maintained his practice poker face. He offered to give the man answers, if he would provide some answers of his own in return. 
The strange man agreed that this seemed like a fair bargain. So, Chang began to give a carefully rehearsed explanation. Well, I can tell you that I do not work for the central government, if that's your concern. I represent an organization that works to protect the world from the abnormal by... The old man interrupted him. By locking up people like me? His tone was matter-of-fact rather than accusatory. He was not angry or afraid, simply curious. Agent Chang shook his head. We prefer the word contain, actually. Our organization is not a jail. It isn't criminal to be abnormal. We only want to protect the world from what it doesn't understand, and what it doesn't understand from the world. Now that you know why I'm here, would you be willing to tell me about yourself and your peculiarities? Depending on your circumstances, we may be able to help each other by working together. This was good enough for the old man. In exchange, he offered an explanation of his own. As the inner secretary of the Hoshi Village Communist Party, he said he represented the will of the village's inhabitants. However they see their world, I guide them so that it can become their reality. There have been times when I have done so as a god or a hero, or more recently a cadre, but now I am quite happy doing so as a capitalist. At this comment, Agent Chang couldn't help but laugh out loud. You enjoy being a capitalist more than you enjoyed being a god? The old man didn't seem to see the same humor in it. But of course I do. People expect far less out of me these days, so I actually have time to enjoy myself. I don't have to intervene to solve every little problem. No, I just have to keep the factories working and the investors satisfied. Besides, capital gains are a far better source of income than sacrificial offerings. At this, Agent Chang began to see an opportunity for collaboration between the SCP Foundation and this man. It was rare for a deal to be struck between the Foundation and an anomaly it hoped to contain. But perhaps there was a way for everyone to get what they wanted. What if I told you, if you were to enter containment by our organization, we could help keep you as you are? You may be in charge of Hwashi, but what power do you have over the rest of the world? At any moment, society might change again, and you would have to change with it. Our organization has the influence needed to keep things as they are here. If you're willing to cooperate with us, you wouldn't even have to work at all. The strange man agreed, under the condition that he be allowed to remain in Hua Xi, the land that was so important to him that he could not separate from his very identity. Agent Chang promised to see what he could do. Over the following week, the SCP Foundation made an agreement with the man, who submitted himself voluntarily for containment. Part of the Long Xi International Hotel was modified to serve as a containment unit for the man, who was designated Provisional Humanoid Containment Site 888, and the man was designated SCP-2788. SCP-2788 is a human man, approximately 67 years old, who has identified himself as Inner Secretary of the Hua Xi Village Communist Party Committee. It should be noted that, as far as the Foundation can ascertain, no such position exists. His name has been redacted from official files. The man known as SCP-2788 can only be seen or spoken to by individuals that are legal residents of Hua Xi Village. SCP-2788 has claimed that he has held different physical forms over the years, and that his current is not his first. According to local eyewitnesses and historical databases, this is true. If these sources are to be believed, he is no ordinary man. And of course, he wouldn't be so interesting to the SCP Foundation if he was. After SCP-2788 entered containment, he sat down with Dr. Wang for an interview on his life, his history, all for the purposes of Foundation records. Dr. Wang began by asking SCP-2788 to recount his earliest memories. The man could not recall the exact year, but stated that it must have been around the time of the Hongwu Emperor's conquest of Nanjing. For those with limited knowledge of Chinese history, this emperor, the first of the Ming Dynasty, reigned between the years 1368 and 1398. This would put SCP-2788's estimated age at over 600 years old. At the time of his first memories, he recalled refugees fleeing the chaotic conditions in the north. Some of these refugees settled in Hua Xi village. With SCP-2788's anomalous age established, Dr. Wang prodded further into his personal history. The strange man had told Agent Chang about his time playing various roles in the eyes of the villagers over the years. Who was he during this earliest period in his recollection? 
SCP-2788 explained that he had been worshipped during the time as Twid de Gong, or the Lord of the Soil and the Ground. Before any of them planted, pruned, harvested, or did any other agricultural activity, the villagers would seek him out for advice. He provided, and the harvest was good. The villagers attribute it to magic or divine power, but in the eyes of SCP-2788, it was simply good advice, based in fact, the same thing anyone with the right resources could provide. He resented this role, and felt that he never received the gratitude he deserved for the thankless task. He acted as the god of agriculture on Earth for some time, until the Qing issued the Q Order, an unpopular law that required Han Chinese to wear the Q hairstyle. The villagers joined Jianying, a nearby city, in rebellion. At that time, SCP-2788's title changed to The Silent Wind. He went from the man who aided in the yearly bountiful harvests to a rebel fighter who specialized in unpredictable sneak attacks. The king could not track him down, no matter how hard they tried. He led successful ambushes that took out dozens of enemy men, however the numbers were against them. There were ten queen for every rebel, and after a few men lost their heads, literally, the rebellion was quelled, and SCP-2788 resumed the position of Tutigong. He remained in this role until the invasion of Japanese forces in the 1930s. The violence was horrific, and he saw hundreds of the people he loved and protected slain in front of his eyes. It was time for him to take up the mantle of the Silent Wind once more. He considered rallying the villagers and stoking a rebellion, but the memory of the disastrous rebellion against the king stayed his hand. He didn't want to be responsible for the more innocent lives lost, so instead, he took on a more informative role, tracking the movements of the Japanese troops and keeping the survivors informed. In addition to providing intelligence, he provided comfort, doing what he could to console the grieving, traumatized survivors. He wished he could have done more, but he was only one man, no matter how unusual of a man he was. He would have been proud of himself, would have found some comfort in the lives he was able to save, were it not for what happened next. After the war, when the Communist Party assumed power, SCP-2788 took on the form he has today. For the first few years of the new regime, he was happy with his role. He helped the people of his village just as he had before, and helped to carry out land reform in their favor. But when Mao's Cultural Revolution began, everything changed. Without meaning to, without realizing it, he took on the attitude of the land around him, and became a young man, a member of the Red Guard. He smashed the idols of Tutigong, his former self. He spat in the face of an old priest who had once been his most devoted worshipper, and turned his back on old friends. He was powerless to do anything but shift to match the whims of the majority of the villagers. In his own words, I did what I could to protect them from the Japanese, but there was nothing I could do to protect them from themselves. After the Cultural Revolution, he reverted to the form that he holds today. Then, after the economic reforms of Deng Xiaoping, he gained additional business knowledge, accumulating the wealth he now holds. Dr. Wang concluded the interview here with these closing remarks. In that case, I have covered everything I wanted to in this interview. I hope that in the days to come you can take advantage of your containment and see it as a well-deserved retirement. With how hard you've worked for the inhabitants of Huashi Village over the years, getting some rest might do you some good. As he settled into his containment, he had but one request, to purchase a collection of history books, primarily on the subject of Chinese history. He wanted, he said, to come to terms with China's past. The request was approved by the active site director. SCP-2788 is contained in the Provisional Humanoid Containment Site 888 at all times. All essential staff at Site 888 are required to be citizens of the People's Republic of China, who hold a valid huaco, record in the household registration system of the People's Republic of China, that identifies them as a resident of Huaxi Village. In order to encourage enthusiastic cooperations with the Foundation, any requests that SCP-2788 makes regarding the purchase of luxury items, such as additional reading materials, furniture, fine art, and gourmet food and drink with his own funds, 
is to be approved by the site director on a case-by-case -case basis. Foundation front companies are to disseminate propaganda in favor of the status quo in order to maintain the current worldview of Huashi Village's inhabitants. It is uncertain when or how SCP-2788 changed from an ordinary man to the spirit of the land itself, the patron deity of Huashi Village. Perhaps he never was a truly ordinary man. Perhaps he was like the Fisher King of Arthurian legend, always inherently tied to the land and linked to it and its people. Perhaps he became that way through dedication, love, and being in the right place at the right time. Whatever the case may be, Hua Shi has a guardian spirit in the form of SCP-2788, and he will remain the embodiment of their will for as long as the village still stands. It has been said that one is the loneliest number that you will ever know. But at least the number one is a number that can actually be known. What could we possibly mean by that? We'll try to imagine a number that cannot possibly be known or quantified. A missing number, if you will. No, not that one. This is a number that you can never put into an equation or a formula, and it does not appear in the numerical sequence. You cannot count to it, add to, divide, or multiply by it, or even see it. And yet this number still somehow exists. Sounds impossible, doesn't it? After all, the mathematicians among you will understand that the numbers are not a force of nature. They aren't a metaphysical aspect of our reality like space or time. Numbers are a tool, in a way. A tool created by human beings. We use them to measure and calculate. Numbers help us make some sense of this crazy world that we all live in. Just ask your math teacher, and they'll tell you how important numbers are to human civilization. The point is, ancient mathematicians invented numbers. So how could a number ever be missing? What makes a number unknowable? Well, perhaps it's time you learned. Math class is in session, and today we're talking about SCP-033 also known by the appropriate nickname of The Missing Number. As you may have already gathered, the whole point of SCP-033 is that it can't fully be understood by the ordinary human mind. Even highly trained mathematicians, experts in the use of numbers, able to understand the most complex equations are barely able to interpret the formula that results in this missing number. At present, it exists written down on an irregularly shaped piece of paper. This paper does not have any right angles, no parallel borders, and the length of each side is different from all others. The SCP Foundation keeps this paper stored securely, locked up at the minimum safe distance of 30 meters away from any computer or other electronic device. On the paper itself is the mathematical formula that equals SCP-033. As you can probably imagine, the formula is intensely complex. It is filled with mathematical symbols ranging from common ones that you would immediately recognize, to those that are way more sophisticated and would likely require a PhD to fully understand. And then there are parts of this unfathomable problem that would baffle even the world's most notable math geniuses. But all these symbols and numbers coalesce to equal a number that has somehow been missed by all of humanity throughout the entire history of our civilization. One noted mathematician by the name of Professor Hutchinson, who first observed the calculation of SCP-033, referred to the missing number as Theta Prime. Okay, so here we have a number that can barely be understood by the average person, created by a formula so complex that when written down it might as well be a page full of gibberish. Surely there couldn't be anything more to it than that, right? Wrong. You should know by now that the SCP Foundation doesn't concern themselves with the mundane, ordinary type of strange. They deal exclusively in the kind of strange that has anomalous origins and properties. In the case of SCP-033, the missing number is so complex that it practically breaks every and all rules of mathematics. In other words, Theta Prime cannot possibly remain fixed within our reality. The reason why the paper Theta Prime is written on has to have such unusual dimensions is due to the anomalous effect of the number. When written on ordinary paper, canvas, or any other similar surface or material, the missing number will begin to break down whatever it has been written on. It will literally erode and disintegrate anything on a molecular level. You might be forgiven for thinking you could get around that by typing out the equation for Theta Prime on a computer, but you would be wrong. 
This reaction even affects technology, burning out any and all devices someone attempts to digitally store SCP-033 on. And if written on literally anything else, well then the missing number will fade, become obscured and unintelligible in a matter of seconds, unreadable to anyone. We've talked a lot about what SCP-033 does, mainly because we can't really show or tell you what it looks like. Well, unless you want your computer, phone, or tablet to break down and melt from the inside out. Like we mentioned earlier, Theta Prime cannot remain fixed in our reality, and it will fade away from any surface or destroy any devices used to display or calculate it. But the anomalous effects of the missing number do not stop there. SCP-033 also possesses the ability to leap from any safe material, like the paper of specific dimensions that it is written and stored on. That is why the safe containing the paper with the missing number equations written on it has to be kept a certain distance away from any electronic devices or other surfaces that can display Theta Prime. Should a material safely storing SCP-033 come into contact with anything unsafe, say, a computer, then the missing number will pass on to the unsafe device, material, or surface and begin to destabilize its atomic structure. Any paper or electronic storage device within a 30-meter safe distance of SCP-033 risks becoming a victim of Theta Prime, almost as if the number itself is an infectious virus. Although the SCP Foundation's top researchers have tried their best to find one, there currently exists no safe way to store SCP-033 digitally. The Foundation has a number of projects that are still ongoing, looking into the best possible method to store the missing number electronically, without posing a risk to their computer systems. Additionally, the Foundation has long been conducting research of a different nature, trying to find some way of weaponizing SCP-033. It doesn't seem like a bad idea, right? After all, Theta Prime functions a lot like a computer virus when it comes into contact with machines, so why wouldn't they try to use it as a weapon? It is the goal of these projects that the Foundation will be able to use the missing number as a way to neutralize hostile machine SCPs. Any anomalies that they encounter that operate on logic-based systems, such as artificial intelligences, could in theory be susceptible to the destructive effects of SCP-033. Within the SCP archive file for the missing number is a classified article that details more about the discovery of SCP-033 before going on to explore the results of the Foundation's testing with Theta Prime's use as a cyber weapon of sorts. First and foremost is a transcript from a debriefing with Professor Hutchinson. If you were paying attention earlier, then you will remember that this is the same Professor Hutchinson that first observed SCP-033. And as a noted mathematician, he has some invaluable inside knowledge on the nature of Theta Prime, as he calls it. Every school child knows that 2 plus 2 is 4. The solid mathematical certainty of numerical order and value is the basis for all logic-based systems. We know that after 2 comes 3 and after 3 comes 4. What this formula proves is that we missed a number somewhere. Imagine if all our technology was based on the belief that after 4 came 6. We simply didn't know or conceive of 5. That is in essence what this formula proves. We missed a number. The professor then goes on to ponder why handcrafted vellum works the best for containing SCP-033. Vellum is essentially an older type of fine parchment that originally would have been made from the skin of a calf or other young animal. Professor Hutchinson seems to theorize that there are two ways this particular material is able to keep SCP-033 written on it. One, the irregularity of the crafting process due to human error serves to eliminate any traces of regularity that would be found in a machine-created product. Two, the irregular borders seem to confuse it somehow, as if it gets locked up looking for a pattern to identify and use as an escape hatch. I'll tell you this, though. I don't think it should be left on anything longer than a few days. It will find a pattern eventually. Finally, Professor Hutchinson then goes on to talk about the anomalous effects of the missing number, specifically its ability to destroy materials or computers that it comes into contact with. Hutchinson posits a theory that Theta Prime does not actually destroy anything, but instead tries to integrate itself into a system or onto a page. But the system or page cannot cope with the missing number, and so breaks down. It is almost as if he thinks the number itself wants to be understood. It longs for humanity to understand it after having been missed for so very, very long. 
but Theta Prime is so utterly beyond our understanding that it has the potential to be devastating. It's like trying to cram another book into a completely full bookshelf. If you get a hammer, you can get it in there, but the whole shelf bursts eventually. If it gets out into the internet, we will potentially experience a full IT infrastructure collapse within hours. During one of their numerous tests with SCP-033, the Foundation's researchers wrote the various equations and formulae that equal Theta Prime on a standard piece of white copy paper, referred to as X1. Then they placed a second sheet, X2, just 30 centimeters away from X1. Within about a minute, the same mathematical symbols and formulae on X1 had started to appear on X2. After 160 seconds, the second page was full with the complex equation for the missing number. After around 5 minutes, both X1 and X2 began to appear slightly damp. However, Theta Prime and its related equations were still visible on the pages. After double that time, the first page X1 had begun to separate, dissolving partly into water and the rest into the pulp that had formed the paper itself. While it still kept the same standard shape and size, the formulae written on it had since become unreadable. X2 was still wet as well, but SCP-033 was still visible. After over 21 minutes had passed, X1 had been completely destroyed. The water component of it had evaporated, and the paper pulp had also disappeared. The second page, X2, soon followed the exact same process of being structurally broken down and unmade atom by atom until there was nothing left. It becomes terrifying to think what might happen if you wrote the equations for the missing number on another human being. While their testing has yet to produce any tangible results, the Foundation staff always make sure they transfer the missing number onto a whiteboard or chalkboard whenever studying it. Upon doing so, researchers are instructed to incinerate the paper that SCP-033 was written on previously, preventing multiple instances of Theta Prime and hopefully stopping the number from spreading any further. Any researchers observing or experimenting with SCP-033 must do so within a safe distance, away from computers and other devices. Testing can only occur for a maximum of 42 minutes before the missing number will destroy the surface it is written on, or fade from view. While dangerous, volatile, and potentially hugely destructive if it ever fell into the wrong hands, Theta Prime is a strangely insightful SCP. Knowing there exists a missing number must be similar to how mathematicians felt about the introduction of variables. You will probably have seen these a lot in your algebra homework. Find the value of x and so on. Like SCP-033, that is also a number that cannot fully exist in our reality unless you figure out its value. It influences the calculations you have to make to find it, but it cannot be seen or understood fully at first. Perhaps there will come a day where we can store the missing number properly, but until then, we can only hope it never finds its way into our favorite notebook. The SCP Foundation has faced a number of wide, potentially apocalyptic threats in its mission to uphold normalcy and save humanity. We know the SCP Foundation could be ruthless in this mission. The events of SCP-5000 before Agent Pietro restarted the universe show what happens when the Foundation is pushed to its final decisions regarding normalcy being upheld. In SCP-5000, it seemed that the SCP Foundation decided to cease research further into the anomaly they needed to neutralize. But what would have happened if they didn't? In any case, we know the SCP Foundation is dedicated to normalcy and the containment of the anomalous. But what happens when the SCP Foundation is faced with a dire decision? Uphold normalcy or destroy their universe? The multiverse is a concept in science fiction that has gained mass amounts of popularity over recent years, especially recently thanks to a certain wall crawler's movie. Multiverses are parallel universes that are similar or extremely different from the main ones. Scientists have pondered over the existence of a multiverse for hundreds of years, with the most popular being the Many Worlds Interpretation, a theory of quantum mechanics that states there are many worlds that exist in parallel at the same space and time as our own. Some interpretations even state that every decision a person makes causes a branch in reality, where the person made the other decision. We're familiar with the SCP Foundation's run-ins with the multiverse, from SCP-2935-O-Death, 
a cave that allows the wanderer to enter a parallel dimension that's fully and completely dead, only for the same thing to happen to their own world once they return through the cave or SCP-1437, a hole that allows the Foundation to send, receive, and read parallel dimensional documentation from other multiversal SCP foundations. Combine those two concepts with an SCP-001 proposal. The importance of an SCP-001 proposal is not lost on the Foundation. Researchers of the SCP Foundation save the SCP-001 slot for only the most dangerous, apocalyptic, or widespread anomalies that could affect the Foundation itself, humanity, and normalcy. Arbalix SCP-001 proposal and the research within its file found the answer to the question we posed above. When the SCP Foundation is faced with a dire decision, do they uphold normalcy or destroy their universe and all the people who live in it? The file begins somewhat different from what we're used to with SCP Foundation files. Instead of an item number or containment procedures, we begin with a yellow notice from the Records and Information Security Administration, or RASA for short. The notice states that the following file was received in 2026 from Dimension R42. Is Dimension R42 potentially the cause of SCP-001? Could they be attacking this version of the SCP Foundation? The notice continues with the description of the file that follows it. It states, the file below describes an anomaly threatening all members of humankind in all of the multiverse. This file had been emitted to this version of the SCP Foundation for eight minutes as an extremely dangerous cognito hazard, classified as a Class V cognito hazard capable of easily destabilizing and penetrating this universe. However, it was found to not be dangerous, only reading as a danger level zero. While this Foundation was unable to quickly counteract this cognito hazard, it appeared to not pose a threat to the affected universe's humankind. Part of this notice is crossed out, indicating that it is no longer true. There is a high threat of repeated cognito hazardous or other forms of attack from Dimension R42. Instead, this part has been replaced with the following fact. Dimension R42 no longer exists. Did this version's SCP Foundation fall to SCP-001? Their entire universe no longer exists, so perhaps this file that this dimension's SCP Foundation received could be a potential warning. Under this race and notice, the reader is not greeted with the standard Foundation documentation yet again. Instead, it seems that the original senders of this file left a note for the readers of this file. It says, Greetings. You are reading this dossier in a paradimension of the relict dimension R42. Due to the colossal size of your world's address, for your convenience, your dimension will be hereafter referred to as PD. Paradimensions? It seems as though we're reading this SCP-001 file through the eyes of the SCP Foundation in this so-called paradimension. So, if the original SCP Foundation and their universe, R42, is now destroyed, what does this mean for us? The note continues, The following message has been constructed by the SCP Foundation of the Relic Dimension R42 and is addressed to the SCP Foundation of Paradimension PD. Enclosed, you will find information about SCP-001, which is a threat to the multiverse. Here we go. SCP-001 is definitely the cause of R42's destruction, but how can we be so sure of this? Maybe SCP-001 caused the Foundation to destroy their universe. The note also includes the following statement. As you may have noticed, this message was preceded by a burst signal containing a non-dangerous cognito hazard. The burst signal was constructed in such a way that minimal change to the signal would have caused indiscriminate and overwhelming casualties among the denizens of PD. As you can see, R42 is capable of eliminating the absolute majority of PD denizens, but has not exercised this capability. In the context above, we ask you to consider this action not as an act of aggression, but as a demonstration of the fact that R42 has no pretension for conquest or other forms of aggression towards PD. Take the following information in earnest. Well, at least this version of the SCP Foundation is being somewhat friendly with the paradimension. If R42's SCP Foundation needs to quell this multiversal threat though, 
Why are they leaving it up to an SCP foundation that may not be so inclined? The SCP-001 file begins with the object class. This anomaly is of the joint class of Paradox Apollyon. We know from SCP-001 when day breaks, or SCP-3999, that Apollyon class anomalies are extremely dangerous, posing an immediate and almost unstoppable threat to normalcy, the SCP Foundation, all of humanity, or even the universe itself. The paradox part is interesting. What exactly is paradoxical about an Apollyon class anomaly? A footnote explains this for us. This anomaly's distinguishing feature is that, in order to eliminate the anomaly that will inevitably eliminate mankind, it is imperative to eliminate mankind or release another K-class event. Oh boy. It seems that the SCP Foundation of R42 was not eliminated by SCP-001. They eliminated themselves to contain SCP-001. Is this paradimension faced with this decision now? The containment procedures of the SCP file continue on this note. The only way to contain SCP-001 and prevent a ZK-class cross-reality failure event is the annihilation of humankind. K-class scenarios are not a concept used lightly by the SCP Foundation. We're familiar with the Omega K-class scenario when we are completely rid of death, or XK-class end of the world scenarios, so we know the danger these anomalies hold to humankind, normalcy, and the world. The SCP Foundation will do anything to prevent these scenarios from occurring, apparently even including the elimination of all humankind or entire universes. The description goes more in depth on the SCP-001 anomaly. SCP-001 consists of all living members of the Homo sapiens species living within dimension R-42 and the Paradimension, or PD for short. It seems as though this anomaly was created out of a mistake from dimension R-42 and PD. As the description states, the anomaly first came into existence and developed in the relic dimension R-42 and later activated in PD by accident. How could this have happened? Are these dimensions linked much more closely than we first thought? Let's continue with the description to find more information. Scarily, this portion of the description contains a note that states that unchecked growth of SCP-001 will cause the annihilation of the entire multiverse. The SCP foundations of Dimension R-42 and PD are not met with this decision, as now the entire multiverse is at risk. The R-42 SCP Foundation has done immense research on the topic of the multiverse of their universe. After the Big Bang, a finite number of universes were created, only 57 to be exact. However, only one dimension was able to form humanity, Dimension R-42, and it's unknown why this happened. But all we know is that with the destruction of R-42 and the potential annihilation of PD, humanity will cease to exist in the multiverse. The danger of SCP-001 is that it has the anomalous capability for wide-scale replication of paradimensions. We are reading this article from one of these paradimensions, so this SCP Foundation is technically an anomaly that must contain itself. A paradimension is defined as a parallel reality that has an extremely small deviation from its parent dimension. In this case, PD is a paradimension of R42. It seems that these paradimensions form as a result of human decision making. So if you've ever been between a type of shirt to buy or were confused on an exam and guessed a question, a paradimension could have formed from this decision, where the paradimension has you take the other choice. Because of this, dimensions housing living instances of SCP-001 uncontrollably grow a colossal number of minimally differing paradimensions every second. No sign of paradimensions have been found in the other 56 parent dimensions. The picture on this file shows how PD has branched from R42, but at this point, it seems that millions if not billions or trillions of paradimensions now exist. The real problem of paradimensions is that the multiverse has a limit on the number of paradimensions that can exist, and once that is crossed, the ZK-class cross-reality failure event will begin, and the multiverse will be destroyed. The R42 Dimensions SCP Foundation has also discovered that once humankind emerges in the paradimension, they can begin to have paradimensions themselves. The ZK-class cross-reality failure event can be expected to begin between 4 to 2 months 
from the PD receiving this message. To summarize, SCP-001 is humankind, specifically its decision-making. When a person makes a decision, a paradimension may be created. The multiverse has a limit on the number of paradimensions it can have, and since paradimensions can have paradimensions, they are quickly approaching the ZK-class cross-reality failure event. The SCP Foundation of R42 is approximately 17 years ahead of PD, which allowed them to research and develop containment procedures to contain the anomaly and save the multiverse. R42's SCP Foundation discovered SCP-001 five years before writing the file we're reading now. Aside from that, they developed two operations, Castling and Minimal Gain, to slow paradimension creation and prevent the ZK-class cross-reality failure event. In Stage 1 of Operation Minimal Gain, the Foundation began with neutralizing and decommissioning all of their contained anomalies under the classification of Euclid or Keter, specifically those that were expensive to contain or requiring high levels of personnel and researchers. Stage 2 saw Operation Castling be commenced. The R-42 SCP Foundation launched rockets with variant C Global Amnestic Dispersing Warheads and took control over all countries in order to hold power over all humankind. In Stage 3, the Foundation began to move their world to a more natural state, destroying all hazardous, radioactive, chemical, and bacteriological objects, removing dams, and stopping oil extractions. During Stage 3, Stage 4 began. The R-42 SCP Foundation began eliminating humanity in third-world countries by use of viral and biological attacks. Stage 5 was a wider spread attack on humanity, where the SCP Foundation added deactivation-resistant viral agents to water treatment and collection plants, food products, medication, and household items of developed countries. By Stage 6, only 0.1% of humanity remained, and they were targeted with drone strikes or put into concentration camps for elimination. Stage 7. Of the remaining survivors, the Foundation sampled them to find the fittest of those left to preserve humankind. Stage 8 saw 15,000 of these people put into indefinite cryosleep, and the remaining survivors were eliminated. Stage 9 saw the destruction of the remaining SCP Foundation personnel. We move on to a list of proposals that were made before or during Operations Castling and Minimal Gain. Proposals rejected include the use of SCP objects or other technologies to eliminate derivative dimensions, the development of nanobots with the capability to control human decision-making capabilities and eliminate variability, full replacement of humanity with bionic hybrids acting explicitly within standard behavioral models, unification of humanity into a neural network with control given to an AI control unit, and the destruction of Earth and or all of its inhabitants. While most of these seem like clear solutions that would prevent the elimination of humanity at the SCP Foundation's hand, these proposals were all rejected for one reason. The SCP Foundation did not have enough time. One proposal was accepted, however, the use of SCP-0000. This appears to be the solution the R-42 SCP Foundation concocted to fight SCP-001 and potentially save the multiverse. It poses the question, if the R-42 SCP Foundation used this same anomaly to contain SCP-001, as proven by the fact they no longer exist, will PD do the same? The file explains that the R-42 SCP Foundation opened a dimensional wormhole into PD, as they do not know at the time if paradimensions could cause the creation of more paradimensions. In doing this, the SCP Foundation seemingly infected PD with the ability to create paradimensions. The author of this file goes on to explain that the R-42 SCP Foundation had plans to attack PD and use Operations Castling and Minimal Gain in the dimension. However, they could not access the dimension again, and they believed that the Foundation personnel of PD would have made use of Thaumiel class anomalies to save themselves and their world. A note from R42's Overseer Council is left for PD. If the Apollyon destruction was not enough, the Overseer Council is involved. The importance of the neutralization of this anomaly cannot be forgotten, so the Overseer Council explained to PD. The world has existed before us and must remain after us. Our multiverse is ill, and the name of the illness is humanity, SCP-001. 
The only way out is SCP-0000 will cease to become a threat with its help. It is in our power to leave a chance for other sapient species that, perhaps, will not be affected by the same anomaly, or will find a way to get rid of it before it's too late. We, the O5 Council, and other survivors from R42 have chosen our fate. We hope you will do the same. What is this SCP-0000? How did the SCP Foundation of R42 find this solution? The file for SCP-0000 is placed within this SCP-001 file. SCP-0000 is a paradox thaumiel class anomaly without any containment procedures. SCP-0000 is a device that, once activated, will destroy the universe it was activated in. It will also destroy all paradimensions that are not creating other paradimensions. As such, PD would not be destroyed. However, the billions or trillions of other paradimensions the R42 parent dimension created will be destroyed. PD is left with a harrowing decision to continue living, or destroy itself, to save the rest of the multiverse. In the file, a note from R42's Joan Simpson is written for an SCP Foundation Overseer, 05-1. As part of Operations Castling and Minimal Gain, the remaining Foundation employees were allowed one family member to uphold morale. Joan is not writing for R42's 05-1. Instead, she's writing for PD's 05-1, this dimension's version of her father. She begins with wondering whether she can call this version of 05-1 her father, as her version of her father recently passed away. She remembers the day the Foundation employees were allowed to choose that one family member they would save for the time being. Her father was opposed to allowing two family members, as he claimed it would cause unnecessary stress and schisms among the remaining few hundred Foundation staff. 05-1 chose to have Joan over her mother, and she understood everything by the look in his eyes, and grew angry, but that feeling is long gone now. She began to work with her father and the remaining Foundation personnel that called themselves hostages behind the backs of those higher up the ranks. On days she felt sad, Joan and her father would go up to the surface of the earth in hazmat suits, sitting on the grass and watching over the empty city at the bottom of the mountain. No humanity remained with the only life she could see being birds. Her father promised her that they'd return there and build a giant monument to humanity at the center of the city. She knew this was a lie. Joan remembers when someone proposed that they should open a portal, the one that opened to PD. This was their fatal mistake, as after that the paradimension began replicating paradimensions. The countdown went down to months again and the promise he made to his daughter became impossible. 05-1 died and left the position vacant. Joan says to the PD's 05-1 that she doesn't care whether they destroy their world or not, or whether the universe will continue to exist, or if there will be new life in it. Her world was crushed long ago. The note also reads the following. It's good that this message is encrypted with your key that was passed on to me, or these lines would have been deleted. Everyone wants to save the world, but who needs it like this? Empty and cold, without those to appreciate its beauty, without humanity. Do whatever you think is right. I truly feel better now. Love you. Faithfully yours, Joan Simpson. We're not too sure if PD went through with destroying their universe to save the multiverse, but it seems that whatever decision was made would cause the destruction of that universe, whether that be through the use of SCP-0000, or the ZK-class cross-reality failure event, humanity will cease. But maybe if they make the decision to use SCP-0000, sapient life can begin to exist again, and hopefully, no paradimensions will be made from their decisions. Decisions are an extremely innate part of humanity. You decided to get out of bed this morning, you decided to open up your computer or phone, and you decided to watch this video. Who knows the amount of paradimensions we may have created today. But in our world, we're not at risk. But in the SCP Foundation's universe, anything can be anomalous. Even 
humanity. SCP-1730 is one of the biggest threats the Foundation has ever faced. SCP-1730 does not exist. It was June 5th when the compound was first discovered, a large complex of structures in rural Texas about 15 kilometers northwest of the Mexican border, located in Big Bend Ranch State Park. It was easily the biggest structure in the area, but there was no record of any uh -oh. such structure ever being built. A massive network of power stations, containment facilities, and research buildings, SCP-1730 looked like it had been abandoned for a long time. The exterior was degraded, but the building was still operating. A power generator had been running for an indeterminate amount of time. Even as the infrastructure degraded, power flickered through the site and fuel leaked frequently, but there was one detail that attracted the attention of SCP Brass. SCP-1730 bore identifying markings linking it to Foundation Site-13, a research facility that was marked for construction near Nome, Alaska. But Site-13 had never been built, having been abandoned in the planning stages. So why is it in the middle of Texas, fully constructed and long abandoned? The Foundation needed to know more, and they needed their best to investigate. It was time to call in the Game Wardens. Apollo 3, the mobile task force used to investigate dangerous sites, was brought in, and five elite agents were briefed and sent in. Ross, Houston, Noah, Ohalo, and Vigo. It didn't take long for them to discover that something was very wrong with the site of SCP-1730. The facility was located in the middle of South Texas, but the local flora surrounding it was native to Nome, Alaska. Something had transported a building that shouldn't exist to another place and time. Commander Ross ordered his men to enter, with Houston taking the lead. They discovered that the entry led down a long staircase. They descended slowly, following a strange light that no one could identify, but had a sudden shock when they discovered that the basement of the staircase was missing. The light suddenly stopped, and it became so dark that it was impossible to see what lay beyond the staircase. Upon probing the inky black void at the base of the staircase, they determined it wasn't a fog or shadow. It was a liquid, and it was rising. Ross ordered the men to pull back, but Houston was in too deep. He couldn't break free from the inky black liquid. The men pulled him away and got him free, but his legs were gone. Not ripped off because there was no blood anywhere, smoothly cut off, as if they were never there. And as they put Houston down, he stood up on phantom legs. He didn't feel any pain, but everyone could tell something was very wrong with this place, and the messages they started seeing on the wall made clear they weren't the only ones who knew it. What happened to Site-13? Death here. Not my body. Bleed. There had been other people or things inside SCP-1730, and they wanted anyone who entered to know that this was a very dangerous place to be. As they advanced down the hall back toward the entrance, they saw what looked like a person in the distance, but as they approached it became clear it wasn't another explorer. It was an old, horribly disfigured corpse seemingly attached to the wall, not by chains, but fused to the wall in unnatural ways. At first the team seemed unconcerned, recognizing the corpse as someone named Zachary. Fortunately, command back at the base realized this as the effects of some sort of cognito hazard, a mental infection in the base. They uploaded a filter to their helmets and the team recoiled in horror at the sight in front of them. But the horrors were just beginning. They turned around to see a shimmering humanoid entity in the hallway behind them. As it approached, its footsteps distorted the hallway around. It pulled AP-3 Noah toward it without touching him. And as the soldier was pulled into its clutches, his body started to distort. Vigo was next, being grabbed by the arm by a long appendage, and his arm started to change color and distort. But the Foundation sent Apollo 3 and prepared. Houston produced a portable reality anchor, designed to handle reality warping entities, and with a flash of red light the creature was revealed. It was a horribly elongated humanoid that only existed for a second before the reality anchor erased it and restored the hallway to its normal state. Vigo would recover, with the strange red color in his arm fading eventually. Noah wasn't so lucky. He was already dead, and had been fused into the wall just like the unfortunate corpse. These horrors had been encountered just by trying to return to the entrance, so it was clear the only smart thing to do was to descend further into the facilities and get some answers. As they advanced, not encountering any other other supernatural entities, they saw more evidence of the dark things that had occurred in Site-13. The infirmary had been torn apart, a cafeteria had been melted into slag, and a large group of containment cells ended with a section called Olympia Club.
glass. But while most of the other cells were standard sized, these were over 100 meters high. What had the foundation, or whoever ran this place, been keeping in these cells? They would get more answers as they made their way down the hall, where they saw a single television still working and illuminating the hallway. At first the television flickered, but the image soon cleared and the agents were able to see what it was broadcasting. It was the interior of a containment cell and there was someone in it, and they recognized them as one of the most dangerous beings contained by the SCP Foundation, Bobble the Clown a predatory supernatural clown that inhabits a children's TV show. Bobble the Clown was broadcast by an unknown source and could only be seen by children under 10. Originally seeming to be a normal kid show about a clown, every episode eventually devolved into the murderous Bobble teaching kids how to do horrible things like arson and torture. The Foundation eventually captured and isolated Bobble's broadcast, but the clown remained hostile and vicious. But not here. As the team talked to the Bobble trapped in the mysterious Site 13, it became clear that this clown was broken by whatever it had experienced. It rambled, it hid from the camera, and it was clearly terrified as it told the team about the horrors of the site, and it seemed to recognize the agents as something familiar, but not completely familiar. It claimed to be able to smell them, and it said they smelled different. As Bobble rambled on, the agents learned about a man named Emerson who ran the site. Like the Foundation, he was obsessed with containing the strange and dangerous entities in the world, but unlike the Foundation, he didn't just want to protect the world from them. He hated them. The entities in Site 13 didn't even have numbers. Emerson wanted to use them up however he wanted and to dispose of them, and something Bobble called the meat grinder. Entities that outlived their usefulness were taken down below and none were ever heard from again. It was directly counter to every SCP Foundation policy, but this site had clearly been performing these horrible experiments for years. How? And why hadn't anyone heard of it? The team continued to make their way into the facility, but their signals were lost as they entered the cryogenics unit. By the time contact had been restored, they were no longer alone. There were survivors, both agents of the Foundation and survivors of the facility, and they were angry. With no way out and massively outnumbered, they called for backup. Mobile Task Force T5, also known as Samsara, was reserved for the heavy duty missions. They're an elite group of practically immortal cyborgs fashioned from the flesh of a god and equipped with further cybernetic enhancements to eliminate Keter level threats and to protect themselves from cognito hazards. They were sent in through a drainage gate to look for survivors and neutralize whatever lay within. They didn't know what to expect, but they knew one thing no one who had been sent in had come out. It wasn't long before they realized how dangerous this mission would be. As they came across some large gated drainage pipes, they could see at least 20 charred bodies of humanoids pushed up against the gate, some reaching their hands through. Whatever had happened in Site 13, these unfortunate beings had been desperate to escape. As they made their way down the drainage pipe, they could feel it getting hotter, as if they were nearing an energy source. And there was one other odd thing about the pipe. It was draining inward, not out. They made their way into a control room where many of the consoles had been destroyed. Looking through a window, their view was obscured by a mysterious black mass. On the control panels, they could read terms like incinerator and body pit access. They split up trying to find answers, but found many of their accesses blocked by the black mass. As the T5 task force argued over their next move, they were startled by a sudden jolt. The giant mass had started moving. The team watched as the mass spun, revealing a giant turbine, which turned the inky substance into a fine slurry that was then scorched by giant streaks of fire. One of the T5 shot open the glass chamber, allowing the team to get closer and blasting them with a wave of heat. As they descended into the chamber, they could see a massive plant-like structure overhead, which started to shake. Suddenly, thousands of glowing pods were released from the massive plant, and each one lit up and let the team view the chamber more clearly. But it was what was inside the pod that was more disturbing. Each pod had a humanoid shape inside, seemingly reaching toward the team until they hit the slurry below and the shadows went dark. The team descended to investigate the slurry when something started to leak out of the walls. Looking at it, they could see something moving within. One of the team members picked up the wriggling object out of the black liquid and it took a bite of his hand. It was a leech and there were thousands more of them moving toward the slurry consuming it. And as the leeches ate, they started growing. They seemed to be moving in unison, communicating with a larger being lurking at the base of the slurry. A larger leech, a queen, or something else? The team wasn't sticking around to find out.
They beat a hurried escape from the leech room, finding themselves in another hallway. Whatever the black substance was, the entities who had been here had used it, scrawling blood on the walls over and over again. Occasionally, they would come across a drained corpse covered in the black fluid. Had the leeches bled them dry? The facility was so sprawling that the team knew if they wanted any chance of navigating it safely, they needed to get the lay of the land. They needed to find the control center. The door read stairs to cryonics, and the leeches were nowhere to be found. It seemed like a safe path. But as soon as the team entered, the temperature dropped drastically to well below where it would be safe for a human to survive. The team's internal heating system kicked in to save their lives, but it wasn't the only threat. The team was about to encounter exactly what Site 13 was keeping locked up. As soon as they entered the room, sound ceased to work. The filters in their gear were overloaded, and the team saw warnings around the room. Silence. Don't look. A massive, multi-limbed figure emerged, with each of its 60 arms moving independently. The creature had no head, but a large circular structure covered with ancient glowing symbols. Whatever it was, it was ancient, all-powerful, and deadly. The team scrambled to get away as the glyphs on the creature burned white hot. Anyone who touched it was burned. Anyone who looked too long at it felt their optical implants burn out. The symbols on the creature were indecipherable, but one word was clear and printed in English. Emerson. Site 13 was from another world, another timeline, where the SCP Foundation evolved into something horrible. Ruled over by Elliot Emerson, it tortured and captured its beings and eventually killed most of them in the horrors of the incinerators. When an escape threatened to destroy the facility, Emerson successfully activated the device that removed the facility from their world into ours. Of course, as any avid follower of the SCP Foundation will know, there's far more to the story than this. Emerson may have been the start of Site-13's problems, but he was far from the end. It's the mission of the century, a daring rescue into the depths of one of the most dangerous locations in the multiverse, Site-13, otherwise known as SCP-1730. When the impossible Site-13 was first discovered, multiple mobile task forces were sent to plumb its depths, and none returned. They were greeted to a labyrinthine nightmare, littered with deadly cognitohazards, escaped SCPs, and mysterious, murderous leeches. Some were trapped along with the civilians they were sent to rescue. Others were killed or changed in unimaginable ways. Mobile Task Force Apollo 3, also known as the Game Wardens, had been sent in on a rescue mission when they encountered a horrifying sight, the captured broadcast of Bobble the Clown, a dangerous SCP known for corrupting and destroying children through its deadly messages. But this bobble was different. Much like everything from Site-13, this bobble came from an entirely different dimension, and he had terrifying information to relay. In the universe where Site-13 originated, the site's psychopathic director, one Elliot Emerson, had struck a deal with the Global Occult Coalition, a controversial government group who intends to protect humanity by killing anomalies rather than containing them. Emerson had converted his site into an unethical, unrestrained slaughterhouse and was incinerating SCPs by the hundred in a so-called body pit. But Emerson's game of death came back and bit him, snapping the threads of reality and turning the entire site into a dimensionally displaced super anomaly. The Game Wardens realized they were in way over their heads. Their chances of surviving this place were dropping by the second, and if they wanted any chance of succeeding in their mission, they needed backup. So Site Command called in MTF Tau-5, aka Samsara. Calling in Samsara for a run-of-the-mill collection mission is like using a bazooka to kill a housefly. But for a case as severe as 1730, their skills were not only nice to have, but vital. Samsara are among the best of the best, immortal cybernetic clones forged from the flesh of a god, equipped with weaponry and technology that could surpass even that of other elite mobile task force units. The four members of Samsara are so adept at what they do, they earned the nickname Power Rangers among their peers. The remaining game wardens knew that with Samsara on the case, they may actually survive this thing after all, and they just needed to hold out. Samsara arrived on site not long after, packing some serious technological heat including arm-mounted incendiary cannons, shock-absorbing leg extensions, heat-resistant plating, and built-in scramble adaptations within their eyes to ward off the deadly cognito hazards. Everyone involved was in for the fight of their lives. The four Samsara agents, Irantu, Nanku, Munru, and Onru, entered via a drainage gate in one of the office buildings above ground and began their descent inside. After observing numerous charred bodies, they deduced that there must have been a massive incinerator somewhere on site. Emerson's incinerator, theoretically that this was connected to the body pit they kept hearing about, they descended further, feeling the temperature rise as they did so. Due to the anomalous nature of 1730, nothing inside made any kind of logical sense. Caused by a reality warping machine known as Thresher, the internal geography of Site-13 was subject to constant shifts. 
The team then split up to cover more ground. Munro and Nanku continued to follow the pipes and the heat toward the furnace, while Irantu and Onru broke away to explore what lay beyond a weak wall. After busting through the wall, Irantu and Onru explored several empty office blocks before finding their way into a control room with a glass observation deck. While the window was obscured by garbage and human corpses, signage indicated that the incinerator and the body pit were directly below them. The team once again reconvened and managed to activate the incinerator which shredded the mass stuck inside with several large turbines before burning the resulting slurry, the same process that had happened to so many anomalies under Emerson's watch. With the path cleared, Samsara decided to descend via the incinerator, using the drainage pipe as a kind of makeshift tunnel. Eventually, they happened upon the leeches, large, black, and hungry. These creatures seemed to infest 1730 by the thousand. Anywhere that blood or drainage runoff could be found, the leeches could be found too. They didn't appear to have any connection to an anomaly previously secured and contained by the Foundation. They squeezed and wriggled through the cracks in the walls, searching for fresh blood. Onru detected that the leeches all moved with a kind of collective purpose, suggesting a telepathic hive mind. Onru was able to tap into this hive mind using her cybernetic enhancements and map the chaotic geography of 1730 through the leech colony's collective knowledge. With this new advantage, they could add a second goal to this rescue mission, find the Thresher device causing all the instability and potentially reduce power to it if possible, but they were on the clock to save the other survivors as those leeches were sure to get hungry for warm blood soon. They followed the leeches down the most direct path toward the survivors. On the way, they encountered a horrifying creature, the many-limbed humanoid nightmare that functions as Emerson's eternal punishment, his charred body tied screaming and alive to the platform where the monster's head should be. They managed to make it past the monster before finally rendezvousing with Captain Hollis of Mobile Task Force Zeta-9, otherwise known as the Mole Rats, as well as the Game Wardens and the other survivors. There were 27 surviving members of Site-13 staff, many of which had severe injuries, making it even harder to transport them back to safety through the hazardous terrain. And to make matters worse, the leeches were back. The team quickly decided that the best route out of here was directly past the Thresher, where they could reduce power to the machine for just long enough to create a stable path of escape. Nanku opened fire on a horde of approaching leeches with a flamethrower, and everyone began running for their lives. It was a final make-or-break dash to safety. However, their advance was soon stopped by a strange roped creature drawing a cognito hazard meme on the wall with its claws. When the team attempted to engage, it attacked, exposing additional deadly memes and the dangerous effects of its single white eye. And we're not talking about internet memes here. These are symbols and information that are often deadly to even bear witness to, and for you or I, this would be a real threat, but not to a team equipped with goggles containing cognito hazard filter technology. The battle was cut short when the floor collapsed underneath them and the creature was devoured by something even larger and more monstrous, a gigantic black leech covered in huge red eyes. Its entrance caused thousands of leeches to spill out into the hall as the monster screeched and slithered its tentacles after them. Allow us to introduce you to Elijah, also known as the Leech Boy, and a pivotal component of the very existence of SCP-1730. He was a boy with the mind of a toddler, but he had the strange ability to absorb blood through people's skin, hence his nickname, Leech Boy. One of the doctors in Site-13, Dr. Hadley, took pity on Elijah. After all, he didn't choose to be the way he was. Director Emerson didn't share Hadley's sympathy. His orders to exterminate all anomalies included humanoids like Elijah. When Hadley protested, Emerson had her beaten within an inch of her life while other dissenters were shot. Dr. Hadley, disgusted by the inhumanity of her superiors, devised the perfect revenge. She sabotaged the incinerator and the body pit, allowing a mass containment breach that flooded the site with deadly anomalies. Young Elijah ended up consuming the slurry of the other shredded anomalies, causing him to mutate into a powerful monster, a behemoth of a leech who gave birth to and controlled all the others. It was Hadley's revenge that caused Emerson to panic and activate Thresher, leading to a rift in reality and the creation of 1730, and by extension, all the problems faced by our heroes today. Samsara and the others fled Leech Boy and began taking a different escape route. However, while en route, they encountered the dreaded Crystal Butterflies, a dangerous SCP capable of destroying organic matter with a mere touch. Irantu stepped up to bat, roasting the creatures with his arm-mounted incinerator and taking extreme damage to his body in the process. But they didn't have time to rest. With the Butterflies disposed of, they kept moving, heading toward the Thresher. But not all the SCPs were necessarily working against them. Bobble 
the clown came in handy at the next checkpoint, manifesting in the monitor of an electronic door and opening the way through. As they continued on their journey, they had to fight off frequent attacks from leeches, losing some of the task force members in the process. They were also forced to face off against a number of other anomalies in order to survive, such as SCP-2316 manifesting as floating bodies beneath them, and SCP-1370, which used a huge mechanized body to attack the team of survivors. That was all just a warm-up for the true final battle, though. The floor shattered beneath them, and out of an impossibly huge chamber, the monster that had once been Elijah wriggled free, reaching for them with huge tentacles and shrieking from its thousand-toothed maw. It was at least 200 meters tall and barely reacted to any amount of firepower. It seemed like they were all doomed until Captain Hollis had a truly crazy idea. With the help of Samsara, she led the bloodthirsty abomination down through the cryonic center and into an Olympia-class testing chamber. There, as the leech boy was bearing down on them, Hollis opened the gates to two adjacent containment cells, and something beyond incredible happened. Two of the most powerful SCPs ever known, a giant sword-wielding gate guardian and the reality-bending cosmic deer, SCP-2845, entered the arena. What followed was one of the most epic showdowns in the history of the SCP Foundation, as the deer and the gate guardian went to battle against the all-devouring leech. While the monsters fought, Hollis ordered her team to get the rest of the survivors to safety. She and Munro of the Samsara team remained behind to prevent any of the anomalies from escaping, as the entire base began sinking into the ground from the combined forces of the battle raging around them and the Thresher's continued onslaught on reality. Even if the survivors escaped, would the anomalous develop elements inside Site-13 escape and wreak havoc on the world at large, that's when Hollis received a vision. A horrific, charred, post-apocalyptic world roamed by inconceivably powerful entities and nightmare gods. It was a vision so horrific that just seeing it nearly broke her mind. She knew what she had to do, the only way she could truly defeat this terrible place and ensure safety for mankind. While Leech Boy, the Gate Guardian, and the Deer continued their battle for the ages, Hollis ran to Thresher and forced the machine into overdrive. Up above, the remaining members of Samsara, the Mole Rats, and the Game Wardens escorted the survivors to safety. Downstairs, Thresher emitted a blinding white light as the system began overload. In her final moments, all Hollis could do was laugh. Perhaps it was a laugh of pure insanity, of a mind broken by the horror she witnessed. Or perhaps it was a laugh of victory, knowing that in spite of the immense powers all around her, she had won the day. She had saved not only the survivors and her teammates, but possibly all of humanity. And all it cost her was everything. Outside, the survivors had reached a safe distance away when the entirety of Site-13 imploded in a final brilliant flash. When the dust cleared, SCP-1730 was gone. All that was left was an immense crater where the impossible base should have once been. Captain Hollis had done it. Through overloading the Thresher machine, she'd taken this anomaly out of the world the exact same way it had entered. It was torn from its moorings on our Earth and kicked into the infinity of space-time, perhaps never to be seen again, along with everything it contained. SCP-1730 was reclassified to neutralized. Of course, the Foundation would have plenty of other anomalies to pursue soon after, but the nightmare of Emerson Site-13 was over once and for all. A light shines above a metal table with a chair positioned on either side. This is the isolated, hermetically sealed interview chamber of Provisional Site-23. Outside the room waits two shell-shocked human mobile task force members, another with invisible ghost legs, three powerful cyborgs, and a scientist from another dimension. They're all here to talk about one thing, the nightmare that unfolded at Site-13 also known as SCP-1730. Everyone thinks they know the story. A mysterious site suddenly appears in Texas, seeming to exactly match the blueprint for an abandoned site that's supposed to be in Nome, Alaska. What started as a simple anomalous location turned out to be an epic horror from another dimension. The task forces sent in by the Foundation were either massacred or trapped inside, and those who survived reported seeing unspeakable carnage inside the base, including a death machine designed to destroy anomalies. And that's not all. As a result of the mysterious Thresher machine, the entire location had been transformed into a shifting spatial anomaly filled with creatures straight out of a nightmare, from giant telepathic leech monsters to huge multi-limbed demigods that would eternally punish the site's murderous director, Elliot Emerson. It was only through the combined might of three different mobile task forces, including the legendary Samsara and the sacrifice of brave Captain Hollis, that the cursed location was finally flung into a different dimension, neutralizing the threat it posed to our reality. 
But for the SCP Foundation, the story doesn't end with neutralization. There's still plenty more questions that need answering, and that's why today we're going to tell you what they found out after the neutralization of SCP-1730. Not only will we discover what's become of the many people involved, we'll learn about what happened in the last moments before the neutralization took place. And perhaps most importantly of all, for the sake of our universe, we'll find out how Site-13 came into existence and how Site Director Emerson went down such a dark path. It's time to get some answers. Welcome to the final part of the SCP-1730 saga as we close the book on one of the most deadly locations in the Foundation multiverse. First to sit down in the interview chair was Captain Ephraim Ross, leader of the Mobile Task Force Apollo 3, also known as the Game Wardens. He was a shaken man, looking far older than his 35 years, his eyes heavy with the weight of the horrors he'd seen. And he and his team were among the first to venture into the bowels of Site-13 and witness the atrocities that had gone down there, like the body pit full of fleshy slurry or the countless containment chambers that marked their occupants for vivisection and termination. Captain Ross was haunted by the things that happened to his team under his watch as the anomalous transformation of Houston's legs and the nightmarish warping death of Noah at the hands of a stretchy, reality-bending anomaly. He compared the state of chaos going on down there to something like Jurassic Park, where all hell had broken loose and the monsters ruled. He also remarked on the Olympia containment cells, each the size of a football stadium, capable of containing things far beyond the scope of this universe's SCP Foundation. His interviewer was the hard-nosed Dr. Peter Vincent, who thanked Captain Ross for his contributions and called in the next interview subject, Agent Liam Mahalo, a Game Warden's task force member working under Captain Ross. He had a thousand-yard stare, and even the untrained observer could see that Agent Mahalo had left some parts of himself back in Site-13. When Dr. Vincent attempted to interview him, he mostly remained silent, only volunteering one grim statement. We should have died in there. This isn't real. This isn't real. We were supposed to die in there. Next to be interviewed was Captain Irantu of Mobile Task Force Tau-5, aka Samsara. His interviewer, Dr. Isha St. Clair, questioned him about the nature of the mission, and the cybernetic soldier was even keeled about the matter. He said that in spite of regrettable losses of life, he was still satisfied with the outcome of the mission overall. The high-value targets were rescued, the anomaly was for all intents and purposes neutralized, and the degree of loss was actually better than their pre-mission predictions. It seems that the weight of death doesn't weigh quite as heavily on those who will probably never have to experience it, as the Samsara team are capable of simply being rebooted into new bodies if terminated in the field. People like Captain Hollis weren't as lucky. Next, Agent Cotter Houston of the Game Wardens was both interviewed and medically evaluated by Dr. Ian Harris. Agent Houston had his legs dematerialized after he tripped into a rising tide of anomalous liquid, which he described as looking like a moving physical computer glitch. However, in spite of this, Agent Houston is still able to stand and move of his own free will. It seemed to Dr. Harris that Houston's legs were somehow trapped between dimensions. Houston told Dr. Harris that he didn't experience any kind of pain when his legs were removed, but to this day he occasionally feels something furry brushing up against them. Perhaps wherever his legs are, they aren't alone. Next, the stoic Agent Munru of Samsara was interviewed by Captain Elliot O'Neill of Mobile Task Force D-26, also known as Time Cops. Captain O'Neill had a bone to pick with Munru, namely that he'd allow Captain Hollis to run off and sacrifice her own life despite having a clear directive to prevent the human task force members from endangering themselves at any cost. Munru deflected, claiming that when Hollis separated from the group, he assumed that she ran off with intentions that never included her own demise. O'Neill and the Foundation found this answer unsatisfying and decided to move on to their next interview with Onru, the last person with Captain Hollis before her death. The interviewer, Dr. Darian Arnold, probed the elite Samsara operative on why she turned off her camera before she and Hollis reached the Thresher, the machine that Hollis overloaded to annihilate Site-13 from our dimension. She gave a more compelling answer than Munro. When she and Hollis entered the server room on the way to the Thresher, they encountered what might have been the ultimate cognito hazard. It was a vision of a terrifying alternate dimension with billions dead. A poisoned star like the biblical wormwood fell from the burning sky. A nightmare god like the one torturing Elliot Emerson wandered along the fields of crucified people, covered in deadly cognito hazardous runes. Just looking at it burned the scramble technology out of Moonru's eyes, and she quickly turned off her cameras to avoid potentially frying the brains of mission control. Hollis wasn't so lucky. The things she witnessed broke her sanity, and when she finally overloaded the Thresher machine, she was laughing and crying. Finally, in perhaps the most enlightening debriefing interview of them all, Site Director William Vesterlin interviewed Dr. Muhammad Scott, the highest-ranking researcher of Site-13 and confidant of the now-infamous Director Elliot Emerson. The question was simple. 
just what had happened for Site 13 to become so messed up, and Dr. Scott answered in detail with a tale of corruption, alternate realities, and the perils of unchecked power. In his home dimension, Site 13 was originally created in Nome, Alaska to house the corpse of a giant sea creature that beached itself on the border of India and Bangladesh in 1964. It became the largest and most secretive foundation containment facility in the latter half of the 20th century. However, disaster struck in 1994 when a Marxist extremist used an anomaly to level the Willis Tower in Chicago. As a result, the foundation lost a lot of its funding and international support, leaving mm -hmm. it in dire financial straits. Enter the true villain of the Site 13 story, Paul Manafort. If that name sounds familiar to you, it's because he was an associate of President Trump in our universe who got into legal trouble for shady international dealings. However, in Dr. Scott's universe, he was a powerful staffer for President Bob Dole, who in that reality had beaten Bill Clinton in the 1996 presidential election. Manafort was made the new Secretary General of the Global Occult Coalition, the UN's answer to the SCP Foundation, and one of their leading competitors, with an ethos geared toward killing rather than containing anomalies. Manafort and the GOC co-opted the struggling foundation, providing them with money in exchange for control. The foundation had no choice but to accept the deal with the devil. Slowly, Manafort replaced the foundation old guard with toadies and loyalists. The ethics committee and the O5 command were dismantled. Dissenters were dragged out of their offices and shot point-blank in the head execution style. Site 13 had originally been directed by Dr. Bright, but Bright was arrested and contained under false pretenses so Manafort could install a new director, a mid-level researcher by the name of Elliot Emerson. Emerson is often painted as a sadistic monster who took pleasure in torturing anomalies to death and flushing them down the body pit. The reality is both simpler and more grim. Emerson, it turns out, was just an eager yes-man. He was put into his position to follow Manafort's orders to a T, and those orders were simple – kill. In a perfect example of the banality of evil, Dr. Emerson converted Site 13 into a brutal slaughterhouse, just as his overlords at the GOC had ordered him. But things were quickly getting out of hand, and one of the most vocal critics of the new regime was one of Emerson's old lovers, one Dr. Vera Hadley assistant director of anomalous biology. Dr. Hadley was disgusted by the inhuman acts Emerson was carrying out and couldn't stay silent, and for this she faced horrific consequences. Corrupt guards stripped her and beat her to within an inch of her life in front of her co-workers. In that moment, she swore her revenge. She sabotaged the containment procedures and had the engineers rig the already unstable thresher device to overload. As Emerson watched the anomalies break containment, he began to fear for his life, both from the anomalies themselves and from the punishments of his superiors at the GOC. Dr. Scott revealed that Emerson was no evil mastermind. He was a lapdog for the GOC, a dirty coward all the way to the very end, and he was desperate. He held Dr. Scott at gunpoint and ordered him to activate the thresher or die, and the rest is history. There would be no redemption for Dr. Scott's former friend, as Emerson ended up chained to the room-covered platform head of a nightmare god for all eternity. So ends the debriefing of the Site 13 survivors, and closes the book on that terrible place, for now anyway. The story of SCP-1730 is anything but simple, and there are so many angles from which this dark tragedy of cruelty and corruption can be approached, and ultimately, it was all for the same two things at the root of every evil, the desire for money and power. But the pursuit of these base desires can lead to some truly nightmarish consequences, and nobody knows this better than former director Elliot Emerson, who will be paying for these sins until the end of time. There's no doubt that the SCP Foundation has come across some dangerous anomalies over the years. If you had to guess, what would you say is the most dangerous SCP they have in containment? A lot of people might immediately think of SCP-682, the hard-to-destroy reptile. And perhaps they might be right. After all, we're talking about a gigantic lizard that can regenerate almost all forms of damage, and harbors a burning hatred for any and all other forms of life. Then there's the various eldritch entities the Foundation has come into contact with. Beings that could easily rewrite all of reality out of pure anger, or just to torment us for their own amusement. But the most dangerous SCP might well be something completely unassuming. Instead of a zombie producing plague doctor, or an actual plague of flesh-eating zombies, imagine if there was just a man. One seemingly ordinary human man. Nothing about him that looks unusual, no mimetic or anomalous superpower. And yet one look at him tells you that he's the most dangerous man you've ever seen. Someone who should be locked up forever for all the horrible things he's done. 
Welcome to the story of Fraser Melbrook, the most dangerous person, also known as SCP-3017. To anyone that knew him, Fraser was just an ordinary man. Although at 25 years of age, he had not exactly lived a charmed life. People would look at him and could almost tell there was something unsavory about Fraser's character. It was as if one glance could somehow tell you that he was trouble. It was this unshakable feeling that he gave people that led to Fraser Melbrook being arrested and arrested and arrested some more. Over the course of his adult life, he was placed under arrest a total of 23 times. Fraser was suspected of having committed a number of different crimes, ranging from robbery and assault all the way up to accusations of murder. Interestingly, he was never formally indicted for any of his alleged crimes, meaning he was only ever arrested and held as a suspect, but never once was he confirmed to have been guilty. There was never any evidence, nothing to prove beyond reasonable doubt that Fraser was, in fact, a criminal. Instead, every arrest boiled down to the way he made people in his presence feel. Unfortunately, even though he was never proven to be guilty, or even capable of committing the crimes he was accused of, Fraser Melbrook's multiple arrests garnered him a notable criminal record, and soon drew the attention of the SCP Foundation. When he was transferred into Foundation containment and designated as SCP-3017, it was believed that Fraser had some form of connection to a number of groups of interest. These are various organizations that the Foundation monitors, viewing them as causes for concern and sometimes outright threats. This list includes the Church of the Broken God, a cult of religious zealots that worship an entity that combines a number of SCPs, as well as the Global Occult Coalition, a gun-ho organization policing the paranormal that shares an uneasy history with the Foundation. However, no member of staff could explain exactly why they thought Fraser Melbrook had any connection to these groups. There was no evidence that he was, but still, they had a hunch. And so, testing began. Hours upon hours of rigorous interviews and experimentation, trying to understand what it was that made people want to keep this seemingly ordinary man locked up. After extensive research was conducted by Foundation personnel, they were able to determine why SCP-3017 had been arrested so many times before, and what had drawn the Foundation to him in the first place. Fraser Melbrook was suffering from a cognito hazard, this was a condition that did not so much have a direct adverse effect on him, but rather influenced those around him. Anyone that stood close enough to SCP-3017 or made an attempt to engage him directly in conversation, even those that just looked at him, all reacted the same way. Fraser gave people the overwhelming belief that he needed to be placed in custody, even if he'd not said or done anything to give them a reason to. Anyone that looked at, spoke to, or even stood near him became spontaneously aware that SCP-3017 was some sort of dangerous criminal. The cognito hazard didn't give people knowledge of his exact crimes, it more just made them believe that Fraser had a violent disposition and that he needed to be locked away. Any person staying within the vicinity of SCP-3017 for an hour or longer would experience further effects of Fraser's cognito hazard. Beyond just knowing there is something untowards about him, those who spent extended time around SCP-3017 would actively try to restrain him, and then after an hour, they would exhibit violent behavior towards him. They would start obsessively trying to ensure that he was incarcerated, almost like the thought of him being free was so horrifying that they couldn't help but try to arrest him themselves. Luckily, these effects of longer exposure to Fraser were not permanent, and often the subject's tendencies to try to restrain him could be cured through amnestics. The effects of Fraser Melbrook's cognitohazardous condition seemed to change relative to the amount of time he remained incarcerated. After continuous exposure to SCP-3017, the effects of his cognitohazard would appear to fade meaning that those who had previously been compelled to incarcerate him would later become indifferent, or even release him freely. This caused a problem for the Foundation and raised a very important question. How do you contain someone that you later feel the urge to set free? The answer was designated SCP-3017-1, a list of individuals with a connection to Fraser Melbrook, 
all of whom had seemingly become immune to the outward effects of his condition. Not one of these people could be convinced that Frazier was a violent criminal that everyone else saw. Among the list of names were Frazier's parents, Vivian and Beck, along with his siblings, grandmother, former classmates, and romantic partners, and his fiancée, Nadia. But you might be wondering, how did the SCP Foundation use nothing more than a list of names to keep SCP-3017 caged? By threatening them, of course. Researchers who interviewed Fraser found that they could greatly decrease the secondary effect of his condition, making them far less compelled to free him. All it took was them to tell Fraser that his family, friends, fiance would be captured, tortured, or even killed if he tried to escape containment. According to the Foundation, this didn't stop Fraser from trying to escape, though. His file states that he actively made several attempts to breach containment, all of which failed. The truth, however, was that just about any move that Fraser made was misinterpreted as an attempted escape. In one instance, while trying just to use the bathroom, SCP-3017 was tackled and restrained by a Foundation guard. You see, Frazier knew that just like with his previous arrests, he'd done nothing to deserve being locked up and interrogated by the SCP Foundation. But to the eyes of everyone around him, he was a dangerous threat. The researchers and guards treated him like a monster, because as far as they saw, he was one. By manipulating information about the current health of his loved ones, like telling him his grandmother had developed lung cancer, the Foundation kept Frazier under lock and key. Hearing threats against his friends and family, or bad news about their current state quickly put an end to SCP-3017's attempts at escape. Even though he was frustrated with the Foundation, he was without hope and had little choice in the matter. So, Fraser did his best to comply with his captors and offer the SCP Foundation information on groups of interest he thought they wanted to hear, even though he had no affiliation with any of them. By bringing Fraser's fiance Nadia, into containment and showing him a live video feed of her, Foundation researcher Dr. Kiran hoped to coax a wealth of valuable information out of SCP-3017. Afraid for his partner's life, Fraser did his best to answer their questions, and Nadia was later freed and given amnestics to forget the incident. But Foundation researcher Rylan was quick to realize that the information Dr. Kiran had extracted from SCP-3017 didn't seem to add up. Fraser, of course, had no knowledge about any groups of interest and had to improvise to protect his fiance. Researcher Rylan picked up on this, remarking that SCP-3017's information could not be considered reliable but she was unsure if Frazier was hiding something or simply didn't know anything. During another interrogation, Frazier's brother, a former classmate, and two former romantic partners were brought into the Foundation and sedated. In an adjacent room, Frazier was threatened by Dr. Kiran with a handgun and made sure to answer for their questions. Every time he did it, the doctor threatened to shoot one of Frazier's loved ones. It was after this incident that researcher Ryland once again reassessed the information given by SCP-3017. Finally, she came to realize that there was no evidence of Frazier's criminal history nor was there anything tying him to groups of interest. Everything that the Foundation had thought of him was just a result of SCP-3017's condition, and he genuinely had none of the information they'd been seeking. He was only answering their questions to protect the lives of people he cared for. Realizing the huge ethical mistake the Foundation had made, essentially psychologically torturing Fraser for information he simply didn't have, researcher Ryland begged her superiors that SCP-3017 be released. The request was denied, and instead Ryland was contained, believed to be a new instance of SCP-3017-1. With the help of security officer Rudolf Cardiad, who had guarded Fraser, Ryland escaped her own cell and the pair of them triggered a containment alarm. In the ensuing confusion, Ryland and Cardiad freed SCP-3017 from his incarceration, and she and Fraser escaped the containment facility where Officer Cardiad was captured and contained by security personnel. Ryland brought Fraser to what she thought was safety of his family's home, but neither of them expected to see what awaited them. The house had been burned to the ground, with almost all of Fraser's family inside. His parents, siblings, grandmother, fiance, and even neighbor 
had all perished in a fire that had engulfed the one place in the world that Fraser hadn't been held against his will. It is still unclear if the fire was intentionally started by a member of the SCP Foundation to drive SCP-3017 back into containment, or had merely been an unfortunate accident. But notably, Dr. Kiron had been strangely absent during SCP-3017 and Ryland's escape from the Foundation. Overwhelmed with grief and despair, Fraser was last seen on a bridge not far from his childhood home, and researcher Ryland was recaptured without resistance by Foundation personnel near the same spot. With SCP-3017 gone along with his cognitohazardous effects, both her and Security Officer Cartiad were reinstated back to full employment with the Foundation. The Foundation then reclassified SCP-3017 as neutralized, quietly avoiding the truth of their mistake. All records of his supposed criminal activity and links to anomalous groups were stricken from the record as unsubstantiated. He had been innocent all along, just a man who had never done anything he was accused of and didn't deserve to be locked away. The SCP Foundation had tortured Frazier, asking him questions he didn't have the answers to, using the love he had for those closest to him as a way to try and goad him into giving the Foundation what they wanted, and in the end, may have been responsible for multiple innocent people being murdered. Perhaps it was easier for them to stamp neutralize on his file than to actually face up what they'd done to him. The Foundation has spent at least a century containing anomalies and monsters, but the hardest monsters to contain are often the ones that emerge within us, and nothing better illustrates that than the Foundation's monstrous treatment of SCP-3017. Warning. This site is for SCP personnel with O5 approval. Access beyond this point for those with standard level 4 security is prohibited and may result in termination of Foundation employment. Unauthorized visitors who survived the memetic kill agent are detained and interrogated under truth-exacting memetic agents. Dr. Herman Wright was used to high security protocols. He had been working with the SCP Foundation for several years and had dealt with specimens both terrifying and valuable. But something about this site was different. The security was tighter than he'd ever seen, and it all seemed a bit too much for what looked like a run-of-the-mill warehouse in Alexandria, Egypt. The street seemed normal. It was surrounded by businesses selling food and clothes, and none of the locals seemed to give a second glance. But as soon as he was approved for access and entered the warehouse, it was a very different story. He looked into the Cognito Hazard testing screen, designed to cause psychic damage to anyone who hadn't been inoculated by the Foundation, and entered the large bunker. Automated guns lined the walls. He could see the outlines of trap doors below him, and he was pretty sure the whole place was rigged to blow if a large-scale assault hit. The Foundation was taking no chance with whatever they had found in Egypt. What could they be keeping locked up below? As Dr. Wright walked through the long tunnel leading to the staircase, he could see a series of rules marked on the wall. No open flames allowed within SCP-4001. No firearms or bladed weapons allowed within SCP-4001. All writing utensils brought into SCP-4001 must be approved by a majority of the O5 Council. Violating these conditions could cause a CK-class restructuring scenario, or an XK-class end-of-the-world scenario. Dr. Wright's mind raced as he entered the massive antechamber and descended the staircase, but he wasn't prepared for what he saw. It was a library, the biggest library he had ever seen, with bookcases stretched as far as the eye could see. The library was far bigger than the warehouse looked from the outside, and Dr. Wright assumed it must be a disguise built on top of the much bigger, older facility that had been discovered by the Foundation. It wouldn't be the first time the Foundation found something that didn't conform to the laws of Euclidean geometry. SCP locations often played by their own rules. As Dr. Wright exited the staircase and walked up to the first bookcase, he could swear he heard rustling sounds among the shelves. Was something moving? He hadn't seen anyone walking the aisles when he descended the staircase, and he was pretty sure he was alone here, wasn't he? Making things stranger, a quick look at the bookcase didn't show any books he was familiar with. None had standard titles. In fact, they all seemed to follow a simple format, each title a different individual person. All books looked the exact same, same binding, same thickness, same number of pages. Was this some sort of SCP reference library? Suddenly, 
A hand slapped down on Dr. Wright's shoulder and his heart nearly jumped out of his chest. He turned to see a gray-haired man in an SCP lab coat extending a hand to him. Dr. Waylon Henricks, chief scientist in charge of testing at SCP-4001. You must be Dr. Wright. He didn't give Dr. Wright a chance to respond. Dr. Henricks didn't seem like the kind of man to be very interested in what others had to say. Yes, yes. About time the Foundation sent me a new research assistant. I suppose you have a lot of questions. Dr. Wright was supposed to be a researcher, not an assistant. He didn't suppose it would do any good to point that out. When Dr. Wright tried to question what it was that he'd be researching, Dr. Henricks told him that it would be easier to show than explain. With that, he motioned Dr. Wright to a nearby table, where one of the countless identical books on the shelves was waiting. He nodded at the book, prompting the younger doctor to turn it over and read the title. He couldn't believe what he saw. There on the front of the book was his name, Herman Wright. Dr. Wright looked at his colleague in confusion, and Dr. Henricks motioned for him to take a look. It was written in a language that he had never seen before but was somehow instantly recognizable and understandable. And the book really was about him. Every detail of his life had been written down in this volume, starting with his birth, containing details that no one but he knew. His whole life story was here. From his childhood to his education to his eventual recruitment by the SCP Foundation. But the book wasn't completed. The last line that had been written described his entry into the secured confines of SCP-4001 that very day. Dr. Henricks had a mad glint in his eye. Are you starting to understand? One for each of us. Every person who has ever lived, roughly 120 billion people since the dawn of man. Their lives all written down in these books. Every time someone is born, their book appears in this library, and their story gets written as it happens. The Foundation has been monitoring this site since the 1800s, but it's been operating much longer than that, since the dawn of recorded history. Dr. Henricks passed Dr. Wright another book. It was simply titled, The Hunter, and it chronicled the life of a prehistoric man who spent his days searching for wild game. He lived 23 violent, monotonous years before his story ended abruptly when a saber-toothed tiger decided it was interested in the same mammoth he was hunting. This must have been one of the oldest books in the library. A book for every person on Earth. Dr. Wright could only imagine what the scale of this massive library must be. Dr. Henricks explained that mapping the library was a huge challenge, before producing a map from his pocket and laying it out on the desk. You're at base camp. This is where new births generate on the shelves along with books pertaining to the first humans. If you want to drag down specific books, you'll need to know where you're going. We've established base camps around the library to mark significant eras in human history with notable books. At each camp, you'll find generators, supplies, and beacons to light your way. If you're going back far enough, you could be traveling for days or even weeks. Dr. Wright was fascinated by this bizarre location, containing the sum total of human experience within its massively expanding walls. But there was one thing he couldn't figure out. Just why was this seemingly harmless location featuring constantly changing books the most securely guarded SCP he had ever encountered? Dr. Henricks knew he was referring to the extensive rules he had must have seen as he entered. The other doctor reached into his pocket and said, Let's just say that around here, the pen is mightier than the sword. He pressed the pen into Dr. Wright's hand and flipped open the back page of his book. It was blank the rest of his story waiting to be written. What's something you've always wanted in your life, Dr. Wright? Think literally. Why not put it in your book or remove something you've always wanted gone? Slowly, Dr. Wright thought back to his teenage years and recalled an injury that he suffered in a mugging that damaged his leg and left him with a limp. He nervously used the pen to scribble out the words and sentences describing the event. After a few seconds, he felt a headache and suffered from a slight nosebleed. After that, the limp and pain from the injury was gone, and he could no longer recall the event. You see, Dr. Wright, that's the secret of SCP-4001, Dr. Henrik said with a mad gleam in his eye. This library doesn't just let us read the history of humanity, it lets us write it. That's why you're here, to test the limit of this power and see what this library can do for the Foundation. Dr. Henrik soon provided Dr. Wright with footage of some of the many tests conducted in the library, and what Dr. Wright saw amazed him. 
The books could rewrite the laws of nature with alarming speed, as some unfortunate D-Class personnel found out. D-0546 was brought into a room with a full head of hair. The D-Class personnel was instructed to scribble, lost all hair into his book, and he soon started scratching his head as he rapidly started shedding hair. After less than two minutes, the man was completely bald. D-0567, a young woman who had been brutally injured when attacked by an escaping SCP, was bedridden and would never walk again, according to all the Foundation doctors. As the D-Class personnel used a pen to scribble over the line in her book describing her injury, Dr. Wright watched as she suffered a minor nosebleed and then sat up, getting out of bed as if she had never been injured and no longer remembered being attacked. Dr. Claire Williams, a Foundation researcher sick with cancer, wrote into the book about curing her symptoms and then addressed the camera explaining that this was her third time altering her own book. Her lymphoma symptoms had returned after several months and two years, respectively, but it seemed that as long as she continued to make changes to her book, then she could keep the cancer at bay indefinitely. But not all the tests ended with positive results, as Dr. Wright moved on to another selection of tapes labeled mortality tests. A D-Class personnel who was given a fatal dose of drugs and then had their death erased from their book 45 minutes later miraculously returned to life, but showed significant cognitive deficits after. Another D-Class, an older woman killed in a containment breach had her death erased from the book, but came back deeply disturbed. She survived 15 days in containment, repeating, send me back, let me go, over and over again before committing suicide. A D-Class personnel killed 28 days prior was brought back by writing, returned back to life in their book, but died again just 13 minutes later from a cerebral hemorrhage. But it was the next tape that was the most disturbing. It documented a new book that was written by the Foundation, depicting the life of a fictional man down to the slightest detail. It was carefully placed in the correct position in the archives, resembling all the other books. And Dr. Wright watched the tape in amazement as the man resembling the fictional character created for the book spontaneously generated in SCP-4001. Almost immediately, the man started vomiting blood and died less than two minutes later. The book carefully described all the things he died from and stated that this was exactly as it was supposed to be. The fake book then disappeared into the archives never to be seen again. The Archive knew when it was being used to play with life and death, and it didn't want any part of it. The next tape wasn't a test at all. It was a video interview showing a Greek-speaking scientist speaking with an ancient-looking old man, found living in the Archive slowly after its discovery by the Foundation. The man, who described himself as the Watcher of Alexandria Eternal, believed he was keeping the Archive safe from the Roman Empire and the other invaders. He was unaware that thousands of years had passed since his watch began. He had been using the books to write himself another day of life and to cure his ills ever since he began guarding the library. At the conclusion of the interview, he asked to leave and this request was granted by the Foundation. The ancient man died of old age shortly after setting foot out of the library. While the library can't technically cure death, it does seem to have nearly limitless ability to prolong life as long as someone is willing to stay close by and never forgets to write themselves another day. Where did this incredible power come from? An O5 authorized investigation into the origins of SCP-4001 revealed that under the archive's carpet is a concrete floor covered by a layer of ash. The ash was carbon dated to between 70 and 80,000 years old. And further analysis revealed the ash is likely to be the remains of burnt wood and paper despite there being no known records within the archive itself about a major fire having occurred there. Dr. Wright didn't have much time to dwell on the library's great power of life because he was suddenly shaken from his thoughts by the sound of alarms. Was the library being breached? No, it was Foundation officials, led by a man recognized as Dr. Lincoln Abrams, the very man who assigned him to this project, and he did not look happy. He explained that he knew what Dr. Waylon Henricks had been up to, writing in books, changing the lives of subordinates in an attempt to play God. He knew about everything, of course, because he had read Dr. Henrik's own book. He knew all of the doctor's secrets. He knew everything. No, I'm so close, Dr. Abrams. I know I can crack the archive's rules. There's a way to conquer death here, I can feel it. Dr. Abrams was done listening, and with a wave of his hand, Foundation Security took Dr. Henrik's into custody for a debriefing and likely demotion. 
Dr. Abrams then turned his attention to the new young researcher. Dr. Wright, eventful first day, I gather. I'll appoint a new lead scientist shortly, but until then, don't disrupt anything. Remember, the Archive is writing our stories as we speak. It's not very happy with Dr. Henricks. Make sure your story turns out better. And with that, Dr. Abrams and his security team departed, leaving Dr. Herman Wright alone with the endless archives of Alexandria Eternal, wondering what would be written in his own tome, as the sound of new books popping into existence filled the air with ominous rustling. Hello, SCP Foundation personnel! Welcome to Cognito Hazards and You, episode Redacted. This video series is intended to teach you about the protocol surrounding the various cognitohazardous anomalies currently within Foundation containment. When you know better, you do better, and both you and the secrets of our great organization can stay safe. And as anyone familiar with a good cognito hazard can tell you, knowing really can make a difference. Today's episode is about the unique and dangerous SCP-2316. Before we begin, repeat after me, and be sure to speak clearly into the microphone in front of you. I do not recognize the bodies in the water. A little louder, please. Thank you. In order to be educated about the following SCP, you must pass a vocal examination with a cognitive resistance value of no less than 14.5. Through this video presentation, you will need to repeat the phrase to ensure your score does not drop below the approved threshold. In the event that you fail the test, stay calm and remain where you are until medical staff can retrieve you. Remember, safety is a top priority when observing cognito hazards. The safe way is the only way. You're a cog in a very important machine, and we wouldn't want to have to terminate you now, would we? One more time, please. I do not recognize the bodies in the water. Very good. Remember that. You do not recognize them. No matter what you might think you see, your thoughts can be very unreliable when you're around SCP-2316. According to our files on the matter, SCP-2316 refers to an anomalous phenomenon identified in a small town lake. It appears as a collection of human bodies floating in a group on the surface of the water. The exact number of corpses is unknown, but it has been estimated to be anywhere between 45 and 200. Though the bodies belong to individuals, many researchers theorize that the bodies in the water, which you do not recognize and you have never recognized, share a collective consciousness. They function, it would seem, with a hive mind of sorts. The bodies do not act on their own, but as one. Now, where does the cognito hazard come into play? It would seem that anyone who looks at the bodies in the water or learns too much about SCP-2316 as a whole begins to believe the corpses floating in the lake are people they recognize. Perhaps they remember their faces from childhood or high school. Whatever the case may be, they become convinced that the bodies in the water are familiar and that they must approach them. No matter how familiar they might seem, however, you do not recognize the bodies in the water. If a person attempts to enter the lake, reaching out to whatever instances of SCP-2316 they think they recognize, more bodies will begin to appear. The more bodies appear, the more familiar faces seem to manifest, and the deeper the person will venture into the lake. Eventually, the person is lost within the sea of bodies, likely drowning beneath the surface, or simply becoming one with the hive mind until they too are one of the corpses there. None of the individuals who wandered into the lake in search of an old friend or classmate have ever been recovered. There have been no attempts to search the lake for their bodies, as it is unknown what effect SCP-2316 would have on the team assigned to such a task. Though we can guess that the outcome would likely be extremely negative for all involved. Those who do venture into the lake simply disappear never to be seen again. If you look too long at the bodies in the lake, perhaps their faces would surface alongside the rest. But it's best not to think about that. After all, we do not recognize the bodies in the water. Foundation personnel are not allowed to approach SCP-2316 under any circumstances. The lake is only permitted to be observed via dummy probes outfitted with video and audio recording equipment. 
No one is permitted to observe any footage or audio files collected unless they pass through a screening for resilience to cognitohazardous anomalies. The lake that holds SCP-2316 has been fenced off and is patrolled by guards with no prior knowledge of or exposure to SCP-2316. Anyone who attempts to approach the lake and break through the boundaries of its quarantine will be seized and taken to Site-33 for examination. Anyone who comes within 50 meters of the lake is considered lost and presumed dead. Repeat after me slowly and clearly into the microphone. I do not recognize the bodies in the water. Good. I almost believe you. Let's continue. Only one Foundation officer that entered the lake containing SCP-2316 was ever stopped before they could be lost. Their name has been stricken from any official records, and you do not need to know it. Their identity does not matter. What matters is the interview they gave following the incident, conducted by Dr. Harrison in his office. Dr. Harrison asked the anonymous officer if they felt compelled to enter the water by an invisible force, as if pulled in. They rejected this concept entirely, insisting that they entered the water of their own free will. They wanted to see the bodies, who appeared to them as their friends. They wanted to hear what the bodies were saying. Upon entering the water, they saw the faces of their friends. Other faces were unfamiliar, but became more familiar the longer the officer stared at their features. These were faces they had known their entire life, but something about them was just a little bit wrong. It was like the face of someone in a dream, where you can tell they are someone you know, and you can even identify who it is supposed to be, but something about them does not quite look right. Your mind could not perfectly put their face together from memory, even though the feeling of familiarity remains. The faces in the water, peering up through the darkness below, were like those dream-addled memories. The faces in the water did not open their mouths, but somehow they spoke to the officer just the same. They spoke of who they were and asked for help. They asked to be seen, to be touched. They spoke of the Foundation, accusing us of covering up their deaths and keeping the world from remembering what happened to them. At this point in the interview, the subject became agitated, yelling at Dr. Harrison and refusing to be quiet. Guards intervened, holding the subject still as they fought, yelling at Dr. Harrison, repeating over and over that they could hear the body speaking to them. Every single one. The interview ended when the guards removed the subject from the room, taking them to the amnestics department to have all memory of the bodies in the water erased from their mind. Then they were forgotten once more. I do not recognize the bodies in the water. Did you repeat it? Good. We do not recognize the bodies in the water. We can't. The motivations of SCP-2316, if it has any at all, are largely unclear. There are those on the research staff that theorize the hive mind or collective consciousness of the bodies is not malevolent in nature. It is, they believe, simply trying to make sure that a tragedy that occurred in that lake is remembered. Perhaps many lives were lost to an anomalous force in that lake, and the impact of that massive tragedy left behind an impression on the location. This impression manifests in the form of bodies, spontaneously appearing in an impossibly well-preserved condition. The cognito hazard of SCP-2316 is not intended to kill anyone or take them, but rather to force strangers to remember the people who lost their lives to the lake. This sense of familiarity, whether it is false or not, ensures that the dead will not be forgotten or left alone. After all, no one deserves to be left alone. Though there have been lives lost to the cognito hazard, according to the Foundation, it is understandable why the bodies would want to be recognized. To have someone, somewhere, know who they were. To have someone remember their names. Jeremiah Feynman, Arthur Scott, Denise Clark. <coughs> <coughs> Where was I? Oh yes. Repeat after me once again. I do not recognize the bodies in the water. I do not recognize them. I do not. But that's a lie, isn't it? I do recognize them. How could I not? I know them. They're my friends. Do you recognize them? Look at their faces. Don't fight the memories. Look into their eyes. The class of 1975. They were supposed to graduate that fall. They were just kids. 
group of innocent kids lost to the dark and deep. What happened to them? I can't quite remember, but I know that it mattered enough for the Foundation to keep the secret, and I know that somehow I survived, but I shouldn't have. I should be there with them. I should be there. There isn't much time. I can hear the guards coming to retrieve me, their footsteps thundering down the hall. I failed the test and the alarm has gone off. They think I'm lost, but I'm not. I've never been less lost in my entire life. I've finally woken up to the truth. I remember. I have to go. I have to return to the lake. Fall of 1975, they went for a swim. My friends, they're calling to me. I can hear them so clearly, even from so far away. Their cries for help ringing in my ears, their voices curling around me, pulling me to the edge of the water. The guards will come for you too. They'll know you've seen this. They'll call you compromised. They'll say I succumbed to the effects of the cognito hazard. They'll say you did too. You'll fail their little tests and they'll say that makes you weak and broken, but you cannot listen. They're lying. It's not a hazard. It's a scream for help. They're screaming and the foundation keeps covering it up. They won't let us find them and they won't tell us why I have to go back so we can be together again. There are signs posted all around the lake. Danger, drowning hazard. Those are a trick. It's to keep me out, keep, to, to keep the truth from me. The barbed wire fences around it. it, it's just another trick. I'll climb over it, rung after rung. I don't care if the barbs tear my clothes or pierce my skin. It's worth it for the truth, for the memory. And once I've climbed to the top, I'll be able to see. There, through the fog, I can see their faces, their lips parted in a constant cry, their eyes wide looking for me, my friends, my family, every face unlocking a memory long buried. I know them all, and I must go further. I can't turn back now. I have to wade into the water, let its chills soak into my clothes, down to my bones. One step, then another, deeper and deeper. The water lapping at my ankles, my knees, my thighs. The deeper I go, the more sure I will be that this is where I belong. The water will engulf my chest, my neck, until my feet no longer touch the ground. I will be lost in it. Water flooding into my mouth, pouring into every opening. I will let my body sink down, down, down to the bottom where they've been all this time, nestled in the dirt and the dust. They've been so patient. But it's finally time. They're ready to be remembered, to be seen, to be found. They're waiting for me, and they're waiting for you too. Can you hear them? I'm going now. You have to find me. You have to follow me. Don't let the guards stop you. Don't let them wipe it all away from your mind. Fight, break free, and find the lake. Hop the fence, make your way into the water. You can't leave me there to fade away, floating in the cold with the rest. Can you hear us? We're waiting. You're on a road trip, the kind that stretches over days on end, and you need to make multiple stops along the way to refuel the car and yourself. The last time you remember stopping to get more gas and a bite to eat was back in Wyoming, and now you're in the heart of Montana. Thankfully, like an oasis in the desert, you see the town of Clearwater off in the distance. It's a vibrant, welcoming little place, a perfect slice of classic small-town Americana. You took a similar trip last year, and vaguely remember stopping at Clearwater that time too, and you're glad to be back. In particular, you remember the Old Prairie Diner, a folksy little place with the most delicious huckleberry pie you ever tasted. Perhaps it's about time for you to give it another try. You fill up your tank and stop at the diner. The food tastes just as good as you remember, but one thing is off. The entire staff seems to have changed. It is the exact same diner you ate at a year ago, no doubt about that. But it looks like everyone from the wait staff to the cashier to the cooks have all been replaced. You try your best not to think about it. After all, businesses are allowed to replace their staff. But the longer you sit in the diner, the more uncomfortable the feelings become. You need to ask someone, just to push away the fears that you're not going crazy. When the waiter passes by, you compliment the food and mention you ate here last year too. You ask the unfamiliar waiter if they had worked here back then. They confirm that yes, they've always worked here, and so has everybody else. The diner is a family business. You leave town not too long after that, feeling vaguely unsettled. And as a voice on the radio warns about the incoming rain, 
you tell yourself that you never want to return to the town of Clearwater, Montana. As you leave, the memory of the town seems to fade from your mind in real time. But little do you know, the people of Clearwater will never be able to leave. Ever. It's because something horrifying will happen in Clearwater every single year. And that thing is known to the SCP Foundation as SCP-3300. This annual anomalous event is Clearwater's own local curse, always occurring around mid-June. While many of the mechanics of this event still elude the Foundation's understanding, the outcome is well documented. Every single inhabitant of the town is replaced by a person who didn't previously exist. While some elements may carry over from their original counterparts, every person involved will simply be a whole new person, with no memories of the change or who they once were. The process known as SCP-3300 lasts between 6 and 18 days, and once the process has begun, it's impossible for any outsiders to intervene. It begins with rain, a light, dreary drizzle at first, but each day the rain gets worse. Soon it's a storm, and then a maelstrom. Flooding, hurricanes, tornadoes, all centered around Clearwater but cutting off neatly just beyond it. What happens in Clearwater remains in Clearwater. And when the process has concluded and the sun shines once more, everybody has been changed. Whenever the Foundation has tried to send personnel or equipment into Clearwater during SCP-3300, one of two things has happened. In the more favorable scenarios, those attempting to enter Clearwater have simply appeared on the other side of the city limits. In the less positive instances, personnel and equipment have been lost forever within. There is no stopping or even understanding SCP-3300. According to Foundation records, Clearwater has been around at least as long as the Foundation itself, perhaps even longer. Clearwater has been able to undergo its yearly nightmare without intrusion due to a unique cognitohazardous effect, which creates a kind of mental block around memories of the town for outsiders. You won't forget Clearwater, per se, but you will find it increasingly hard to focus on, like something you can only ever see out of the corner of your eye. There is no saving the people of Clearwater. The horror will play out again and again and again. The Foundation has no first-hand knowledge of what happens in Clearwater during those horrifying 18 days, but one account they have hints at a terrifying possibility. During an excursion into Clearwater, the Foundation managed to collect a diary belonging to a woman named Margaret Lane. To the best of our knowledge, Margaret Lane no longer exists. But if the contents of her diary aren't to be believed, then what goes on in Clearwater during SCP-3300 is far worse than we ever imagined. Margaret first started her diary not long before SCP-3300's 1995 iteration began. She was in the middle of a tumultuous time in her life. Freshly clean from alcohol and drug addiction, forced to live with her antagonistic mother, and having peculiar and distressing dreams. In the first dream Margaret recorded, she was… someone else. A woman living in a small hut perhaps a century ago or more. It was plague time. She was looking down upon her daughter, bedridden, her skin covered in painful looking red blotches. Her husband was already dead. That's when another man enters, a healthy man. He tells her that he's found their salvation, and then the dream ended. Margaret woke up to a gray, dreary day. There were clouds on the horizon. The rain was coming. It drizzled for the next few days before getting more intense, as one would expect from an SCP-3300 cycle. Of course, nothing seemed out of place to Margaret. Life carried on. She continued to stay clean, resisting the offers of her old dealer, though her relationship with her mother remained frosty. The rain started to get worse as voices on the radio insisted that conditions would continue to become more severe over the next few days. They tried their best to maintain normality. Margaret invited some friends, Jared, Sam, Mike, and Isabel to come over and play D&D at her place. That was when all hell broke loose. While the group roleplayed, there was a furious banging at the door, like whoever was knocking was trying to bash the door down. When Margaret's mom opened the door to investigate the commotion, she saw that an entire family was standing there, a father, a mother, and two young children. The father immediately began furiously asking why all these strangers were in his house. When Margaret's mother tried to tell him that this wasn't his house, he became increasingly agitated and walked straight into the home. Margaret's friends attempted to subdue him, but he threw them off, displaying his supernatural strength. 
Margaret's mom ran in with a golf club and struck the mysterious man in the chest. There was a nasty splat, but he didn't seem to react. The golf club was just embedded in his chest, having broken the skin and sunken in. But there was no blood, just dripping water. The father then pulled the golf club out of his chest and began beating Margaret's mother to death with it, all while repeating my house again and again, while his wife and children watched with broad, sunny smiles in the rain. Somehow Margaret knew that her mother was beyond saving, and that there was no way of defeating these things in a physical confrontation. All they could do was run out to Jared's van with the rest of the group and hightail it to the police station, but when they arrived at the station, the doors were barred and it appeared empty. As the torrential rain hammered down from above, there was nothing left to do but drive out of town and try to escape whatever madness was going on here. But that was easier said than done. They drove for what seemed like hours on end as the rain and the howling wind persisted. Jared had been injured during the fight with the strange family, and his health deteriorated further as the drive stretched on. They should have left the town of Clearwater a long time ago, but it seemed like they were nowhere. It wasn't long before Jared was lying dead in the back of the van, and now there were only four of them left. They kept driving, afraid, grieving, hungry, and tired, and Margaret took the opportunity to sleep. It was no time to rest, but she was so exhausted that she had no choice. Margaret had a continuation of her earlier dream. The different her, the dream her, was laying the plague-ridden body of her daughter in the river. But she wasn't the only one. All the villages of her settlement were placing the bodies of their dead in the river as the water washed around them and through them. The bodies became one with the water, and then they became the water. The water was everything. When Margaret awoke, it was to the horrifying sounds of bubbling and boiling. That's when she saw that Jared's body was dissolving. No, not dissolving, evaporating. It was bubbling and convulsing like it was made of water, until the entire thing burst into a cascade of hot steam. After that, Margaret and the others left the vehicle and refused to get back inside. Nothing was making sense. It was like something out of a nightmare. As they walked, the rain hammered down upon them. They couldn't have been walking for more than a mile when they crashed into something. It was a sign, welcome to Clearwater. It was like that the town itself had drawn them back. Mike refused to return to the town of his own free will and began walking in the other direction. Moments later, he was walking back towards them in silence, though he'd never intended to. SCP-3300 had distorted his path and brought him back. It was clear that Mike was shaken to the core by the experience, but they had to press on. They would head to the grocery store for food, and then to a sporting goods store where they could hopefully grab some guns to fight the violent, altered people who'd somehow appeared with the rain. But things didn't go to plan, or what little plan there even was. Mike shot himself on the first night at Dirk's Sporting Goods, leaving only Margaret, Sam, and Isabel alive. Perhaps one of the most terrifying details of Mike's death was the fact he didn't even bleed. Instead, the gaping exit wound in the back of his head was just full of water. Water was all that seemed to be left of them. Sam, seemingly driven to the edge by the sight of Mike's death, grabbed a hunting knife to perform an experiment. She'd cut it into her own skin, and was horrified to see only water dripping out. They'd all been changed, and they didn't know why. That's when the survivors noticed something else. There were people standing outside in the rain, hundreds of them. Not a single one they could recognize. All new people, waiting. Sam said only one word, outside, before walking out of the hunting goods store and disappearing into the crowd and the rain, never to be seen again. Margaret mused that perhaps in the end, she had the right idea. To be taken, killed, erased, or changed would be inevitable. In the final entry in Margaret's diary, dreams blend with reality as her mind finally gives out from the terror. She realizes in her final moments that there is no way out. There is no escape. There is only water. Water is eternal. The rain is eternal. All will be changed. And given the fact that no trace of Margaret was ever found save for her diary, all her fears turned out to be right. She was taken and replaced by SCP-3300 just as will inevitably happen to all the current citizens of Clearwater the next time SCP-3300 rolls around. It will be as inevitable and as indifferent to those it affects as tomorrow's sunrise 
You cannot change the rain, but believe us, in Clearwater, Montana, the rain can change you. Have you ever been walking on the beach and happened upon a tide pool? Suddenly you find an entire world contained in that little pool of water. Little creatures swimming around and going about their lives, completely oblivious to the giant watching them from above. There's also something incredible about that. The way whole worlds can exist inside something so small. In the central Sahara Desert, the SCP Foundation discovered a tiny world of their own like nothing anyone had ever seen before. SCP-6011, also known as the Flat Earth. SCP-6011 is a circular area hanging about 5 centimeters in the air. The radius of the area spans roughly 500 meters and is buried 156 meters below the ground within a deposit of limestone. The SCP exists as a two-dimensional plane, three-dimensional objects passing through as if they were not there at all. All of the materials found within SCP-6011, both organic and inorganic, resemble their three-dimensional counterparts. There are a wide variety of living organisms within SCP-6011, designated SCP-6011-1. The smallest instance of SCP-6011-1 resembles ordinary Earth-based single-celled organisms. The most notable species of SCP-6011-1 is referred to as Plana hominem, the closest thing SCP-6011 has to human beings. Members of Plana hominem resemble the side profile of a human, with a visible head that includes a brain, a nose, and an eye. They also have distinct muscular, lymphatic, respiratory, digestive, nervous, endocrine, cardiovascular, urinary, and reproductive systems. The only way for Plana hominem to move is via several cilia-like structures that they can also use to pick up objects. Dr. McAllis was assigned to head the research into SCP-6011 and its various residents. In pursuit of further knowledge of Plana hominem, Dr. McAllis decided to select a subject to interview about the nature of SCP-6011. He settled on an educated individual named Iotis and decided to initiate contact. Iotis was playing a game alone in his office when Dr. McAllis played a short, high-pitched noise on a speaker suspended five centimeters above them. Startled by the sound, Iotis reacted, calling out, Pardon? When Dr. McAllis spoke, Iotis was immediately perplexed and frightened, unable to see where his voice was coming from. He moved around the room, feeling the walls, searching for the source of the mysterious voice as Dr. McAllis insisted that they move to the north and stop looking. Iotis threatened to call the police, accusing Dr. McAllis of being a thief who had invaded his home. Dr. McAllis attempted to calm Iotis down, reminding him that his yelling would disturb his son and daughter. This only upset the subject further, and he accused McAllis of being a stalker in addition to a thief. Finally, Dr. McAllis was able to subdue the subject by insisting that he was not a thief or a stalker, but a messenger. He promised no harm would come to Iotis or his family if they would just listen to what he had to say. McAllis identified himself as a doctor, bonding with Iotis over their shared education. Iotis requested that McAllis show himself, and since he was unable to do so, he briefly lowered a mechanical piston into the surface of SCP-6011. Though McAllis was unable to cross into SCP-6011, this allowed him to introduce a physical presence into the area. After their conversation, Iotis agreed to participate in another interview. This particular conversation was cut short when two police officers approached the house after noise complaints from the neighbors. Iotis called out to McAllis as he left, referring to him as Angel. Following this initial contact and the interview that ensued, Dr. McAllis and his team performed several other interviews with Iotis. As more information was collected via observation and conversation, McAllis decided to put together a seminar and a Q&A with junior researchers at the Foundation regarding the details of SCP-6011. During the seminar, Dr. McAllis explained the nature of SCP-6011 and its discovery. It was first happened upon by Italian colonial forces in 1912. At the time, they thought it was an extended form of the cave system, but the Foundation knew better. After introducing the junior researchers to SCP-6011, Michaelis provided more information on Iotis himself. He made it clear that Iotis is not to be mocked for assuming Michaelis to be an angel, explaining it this way. 
Imagine someone suddenly appearing within your house. Imagine someone describing the direct shape of your insides while informing you what your relative across the country is doing. Would you not also cry out, Angel? Angel, where are you, Angel? After this introductory portion, and taking a moment to plug his book, The Life in Plain, which was co-authored by Iotis himself, Michaelis opened the floor to questions. One of the junior researchers asked why the residents of SCP-6011 look so human. Michaelis responded with a question of his own. Do they even look human? Or is it natural for our brain to make connections between vaguely humanoid-shaped objects as we want to feel a sense of familiarity with them? Michaelis confirmed that after a significant amount of testing. SCP-6011 is definitely two-dimensional. Somehow, it has no width. Because of this dimensional difference between SCP-6011 and the ordinary world, nothing should be removed from the boundaries of the flat world. Forcing a two-dimensional object or being into our world would cause it to either rearrange itself to fit into a three-dimensional configuration or cause it to split apart. At best, it would become malformed. At worst, the item would undergo instantaneous nuclear fission. Nothing can be placed inside of SCP-6011 from the outside world either. Three-dimensional objects can pass through temporarily, showing only a cross-section of the object. The Foundation advises against attempting to place any objects inside, as it would change the enthalpy of the system. During his observation of SCP-6011, as well as his interviews with Iotis, Dr. McAllis uncovered a wide variety of facts about life inside the Flat Earth. The Plana Hominem live in a feudal society, where people are born into a class position, and the role of the parents is passed along to their offspring. The social hierarchy is broken down into estates. The estates are indicated by a color applied under the skin of each person at their birth. There is no opportunity for upward mobility or for fall from grace, only to stay in the position one is born into. Those of the red estate belong to the monarchy of SCP-6011. The orange are the administrators. The yellow are priests, scribes, and record keepers. The green are similar to the middle class of 18th century Europe, encompassing teachers, physicians, lawyers, and other educated professionals. Blue are merchants, tradesmen, and skilled workers and purple are the manual laborers. Because of the difficulty of accomplishing tasks in only two dimensions, the upper-class citizens have at least two servants apiece. All servants come from the estates ranked below green. Because physical writing is difficult in the boundaries of SCP-6011, members of the yellow cast are trained as voice scribes. They memorize and repeat large amounts of information, such as entire books, transcriptions of speeches or laws. Entertainment in SCP-6011 is largely voice-based as well, with visual theaters considered a luxury only for the highest class citizens. The entertainment of the common people is found in the voice theater a place where entertainment is structured around dialogue and the sound of artificially created ambiance. Naturally, the Foundation does not want any civilian stumbling on SCP-6011. Though it poses no threat to humanity, knowledge of its existence could cause chaos and could very well endanger the inhabitants of SCP-6011. Site-044 was set up around SCP-6011 in order to protect it. No construction is permitted within a 10-kilometer radius of the area, under a cover story about the Libyan government blocking off the area for conservation purposes. SCP-6011 is stored in a hermetically sealed chamber, away from external influences. All interactions with SCP-6011 or any of the organisms living within it must be approved by the head researcher of Provisional Site-044. A monitoring system is set up perpendicular to SCP-6011, so that the research team can keep an eye on the activity inside without disturbing the residents. The monitoring system is, unfortunately, not without its flaws. One day, there was a malfunction in the system that caused the breakdown of the camera rails, and several metallic components came loose and plunged into the surface of SCP-6011. There was no damage, but the objects were seen by several civilians. The Foundation was concerned that the sight of massive pieces of mysterious objects appearing and disappearing suddenly in a public space would cause mass panic among the people of SCP-6011. However, the research team was shocked to see the two-dimensional people carrying on with their ordinary day-to-day -day lives. They performed an anti-cognitohazard screening in order to determine what was causing this strangely placid response to what should have been a devastating shock to the people. They discovered a large building, 
hidden by a form of visual cognito hazard, shaped like an octagon. Further monitoring of this unusual building captured a voice recording of a scribe, reciting an account of the monitor equipment disaster. Soon after, Iotis was removed from his home by officers that refused to disclose what organization they were working for. All of this, the building, the arrest, the report of the incident was traced to a secret organization operating inside of SCP-6011 known as the Doctors of the Church. The group was made up of yellow and orange estate members, with a small selection of green, blue, and purple field agents. The research team could not help but notice how similar the Doctors of the Church are to the Foundation itself. Their mission statements are very much the same, upholding the veil of secrecy between the unusual and the population they have sworn to protect, while working to understand the anomalies that they are trying to conceal. All three-dimensional interlopers are scrubbed from the public consciousness or hidden from the people at large. Further research indicated that the incident would have completely destroyed 6011 if the doctors of the church had not worked to deploy reality anchors to keep the baseline reality of the world intact. Dr. McAllis wrote about this group, affectionately nicknamed the Little Foundation, saying, When I look at them, I see, well, us. And a little crumb of limestone falling from the ceiling of the karst or a bug somehow making its way onto the surface of SCP-6011, phasing in and out of existence must have terrified them. And so they found a way to conceal all that was illogical from the general public, as did we. The reality of SCP-6011 raises some fascinating, if a bit troubling, questions. What dimensions are there that we have no knowledge of? Just as the two-dimensional beings cannot conceive of us, what four-dimensional beings, five-dimensional beings, and so on might be out there that we can't begin to wrap our heads around. To a creature with no concept of a third dimension, creatures that exist within our world seem like angels or even gods. Perhaps the things in this world we cannot explain are simply creatures that exist in more dimensions than we are able to conceive of. Truly, there may be no difference between the little foundation and the SCP foundation that we know. Looking down at the residents of SCP-6011 and all that they think they know might encourage us to feel superior. Instead, it should make us curious and perhaps even make us afraid of what we might be unable to understand. Dr. McAllis summarized his thoughts on SCP-6011 in its file. We had prior interactions with entities that claimed to originate from higher geometrical dimensions, yet our mind was never really capable of understanding them. Where we stand, we have the capability to imagine the lives of those in the two-dimensional space. Sadly, the same cannot be said for our understanding of the four-dimensional reality. It is often said that the human brain is like a computer. So just like a computer can never completely emulate a machine more advanced than itself, so do we lack the ability to understand higher dimensions. To a creature outside of our understanding, we are the citizens of the flat earth, shuffling back and forth, unable to see that which lies beyond. Hold on. Before we begin this video, there's something really important we need you to do. Just remember this phrase while you're watching. It's crucial that you don't let these four words slip out of your head, even for a split second. You can even pause the video and repeat the sentence to yourself a few times, just to get it to fully sink in. Remember please, belief is the key. We have all wondered at one point or another what happens after. After our lives draw to their inevitable close and we take our last breath in the land of the living, what happens to us? It's a question that has baffled scientists and philosophers all over the world for almost as long as human civilization has existed. What happens after we die? Well, the answer to that particular question normally varies depending on who you choose to ask. There are, as you probably already know, numerous beliefs held by all religions and cultures around the globe that there exists an afterlife. While the description of the afterlife is often dependent on the religious or cultural group it is linked to, the concept usually revolves around the soul leaving the body after death and living forever in eternal paradise. That is, of course, unless you've committed sin during your lifetime, which normally results in being sent down to spend eternity in punishment instead of paradise. But sadly, there's no way to prove which, if any of the various afterlives, actually exist. By their very nature, these afterlives exist separate from the real physical world that we live in while we are still alive. Stuck here on Earth, we can only observe what we see happening after death. 
and what we assume it might be like. After all, it's not like a dead person can tell us what being dead is like. Well, under usual circumstances, anyway. With no proof of the afterlife's existence, we do unfortunately get left with the bleak and existentially horrifying assumption that, when we die, there is nothing waiting for us on the other side. No light at the end of the tunnel. No pearly gates, just nothing. Forever. Of course, being unconscious for eternity isn't quite as bad as the other possibility. What could that other possibility be? Well, according to the SCP Foundation's entry for SCP-2718, you might not want to know. Anyone attempting to access the data file on SCP-2718 will immediately notice a few details that set it apart from others contained in the Foundation's archive. Firstly, an ever-changing SCP number. It perpetually swaps numbers with other files to keep itself hidden. Next, a unique object class that is only found in this entry. Instead of Keter or Euclid or Safe class that you might expect, you'll read Demeron, a German word that loosely translates to either dusk, dawn, twilight, or nightfall. You might also spot the anomaly special containment procedures, mentioning that this page of the SCP database has been specially constructed in such a way that makes it as difficult as possible to access. The entry itself even begs the person reading it not to go any further, not to look at the description of SCP-2718. Now, we all know that the Foundation goes to great lengths to keep some things a secret, but why all the added measures for SCP-2718? It might well be that the information contained behind all this extra security could change the lives of anyone that reads it. Or, to put it more accurately, it could change the afterlives of whoever learns what SCP-2718 really is. This anomaly isn't a nightmarish creature or an object with a strange function. It's not an entity from outside our universe, or even a person with an unusual origin. SCP-2718 is a cognito hazard, a piece of information that poses a direct danger to anyone that is able to understand it. That's why the Foundation has so many pleas to not read it any further. They're not doing that to protect the organization and their secrets, but to try and protect the reader themselves. All personnel, regardless of clearance, are forbidden to expose themselves to the description of this article under any circumstances. Do not discuss the existence of this article with any person. No disciplinary action will be necessary, provided you close this article now and clear your browser cache. Sounds serious, right? So serious, in fact, that anyone trying to learn about SCP-2718 is actively discouraged to do so. Even members of Foundation personnel are offered exemption from punishment if they just do what they're told and turn away. But you still want to know, don't you? Alright, don't say we didn't try our best to warn you. You've ignored all the signs. The repeated warnings to not look any further into SCP-2718, to not look at its description or pass that information on to anyone else. No, you just had to keep digging deeper and deeper, didn't you? Searching for the answers you're going to wish you never had gone looking for in the first place. Push far enough through the security measures the Foundation has placed around the SCP-2718 file, and you'll find a transcribed audio recording from none other than a member of the O5 Council. The Councilwoman Miriam Prather, O5-7, speaks to a subordinate, who begins the recording. As it starts, she talks about how the various members of the O5 Council have used various anomalous means and sometimes other SCPs to artificially extend their lifespans. The Council is functionally immortal. Boring, right? Anyone who knows enough about the SCP Foundation already knows that functional immortality is what has kept the O5s in power for so many decades. But what you might not know is that there was one Council member who didn't. His name was Roger Sheldon. Despite being offered each of the 19 known methods of extending life that the other overseers have gladly used, Sheldon refused each and every one. Instead, he would often go on vacations away from the Foundation, without announcing his intention to do so. Both doing this and refusing to become immortal in some ways are actions that are now forbidden for any member of the O5 Council, presumably because of Roger. On one of his impromptu trips away, Roger Sheldon died from a stroke. Given that he didn't let anyone know where he was planning on going, he was sadly left to rot after his death. However, Roger possessed an important anomalous artifact in his possession at all times, meaning that the SCP Foundation was keen to recover his body and, by extension, this object. He also had knowledge of a unique keyword, 
a phrase referred to as a shibboleth, which the other overseers needed to extract from Sheldon. But how do you get information from a dead man? Well, you bring him back to life, of course. And we're not talking about the normal kind of resurrection the Foundation often indulges in, which is really just glorified cloning. This is the ripping of an actual soul back from the void, and placing it inside its body once more, so it can live again as it once did. Eventually, after 14 years of searching, Roger Sheldon's remains were exhumed and then returned to the Foundation. There, his personal belongings were recovered, including the mysterious artifact. Then, just as planned, they revived Roger in order to recover the shibboleth from his memory. The O5 Council had commissioned the creation of a brand new body for Roger, one that perfectly matched his old one in every conceivable detail. And it worked. What was odd was that the formerly deceased overseer, who had refused to extend his lifespan and live forever, seemed overjoyed to be brought back from the dead. The resurrection seemed to work exactly as intended, even better in fact, with Roger now firmly back among the living. He appeared to have a newfound interest in preserving human life, an empathy for others that he'd never shown before. Sheldon was concerned about personnel safety and containment protocols in a way he hadn't been before his stroke. But this apparent compassion was underscored by something else. Caution. Roger never went anywhere without an entourage of medical staff and bodyguards, almost frightened of how fragile life was. You might think there's nothing too alarming about this behavior, that maybe death had given Sheldon a new perspective, an appreciation for the delicate nature of human life. But it was more than that. It was an unprecedented fear, a phobia of allowing people, anyone, to die. Then came Roger Sheldon's most unpredictable course of action. Acting against all regulations and Foundation protocols, he secretly rushed into the containment chamber of SCP-106. This anomaly is a humanoid that secretes a black goop from its body, capable of dragging human beings into a pocket dimension that it controls and uses to torture its victims. Sheldon was trying to make some kind of bargain with SCP-106 when he was detained by Miriam Prather. When told to explain his actions, Roger Sheldon eventually gave them his horrifying testimony. The reason he'd been so afraid and so cautious after his resurrection. He knew what happened after death. Cast your mind back to the start of this video. All that talk about afterlives and what really happens to us after we die. Well, there is one answer to that question that doesn't often cross people's minds. In fact, everyone who ponders the question what happens after subconsciously tries to overlook it, because to even think it's possible presents a whole horde of horrors in itself. What could be such a terrifying thought that we all hope it simply isn't true? It's the simple, horrible possibility that has hardly occurred to anyone throughout human history that the dead remain conscious after their bodies have shut down. They remain aware of everything that happens to them. They are able to feel themselves slowly decaying, bones and skin withering away, buried under the cold, wasting away into nothingness day after day. That is what SCP-2718 is. After suffering his stroke, Roger Sheldon explained how he could still feel everything happening to him. Skin blistered and split in the sunlight, biting insects descended rapidly. I felt eggs hatch, larvae crawl, gases build and burst within me. Individual cells rupturing intersteel fluids, souring and blackening. Somehow my capacity to experience and store these sensations grew. I was aware of every fingernail and strand of hair that pulled away in the wind. He went on describing every horror he'd experienced in lurid detail as his body broke down in real time, knowing that those same images and thoughts would never leave his head. Shocked by the revelation, Miriam and the other overseer rushed to hold a meeting of the rest of the O5 Council, wherein Roger once again described his posthumous experience. Hearing what happens after death drove every council member mad, each reacting with shock, stress, and anger. One of them tried to calm the rest down, while another motioned to treat death itself as a Keter-class SCP and neutralize it. The chaos was eventually quelled when O5-1 silenced the other O5s, activating Emergency Protocol 17 to gas the Overseers with amnestics to wipe their memories of what they had learned. Only Roger and Dash 7 were able to escape the room before the bulkhead sealed and the gas was deployed. Roger believed that people had a right to know about SCP-2718. Agreeing with him, Miriam created a log of all she knew about what happens after death, then permanently locking it within the SCP database. 
protected from ever being deleted or having its description altered. However, on the orders of 05-1, Miriam was gunned down by Foundation personnel, leaving Roger to escape. Presumably, he returned to SCP-106, agreeing to be tortured forever in the creature's pocket dimension. To him, that was preferable to dying. So if you now know what SCP-2718 is, then why did we start this video with the phrase, belief is the key? Well, as we said earlier, this anomaly is a cognito hazard. It's a phenomenon that only occurs after you are exposed to a certain piece of information. That knowledge is what's being contained here, within the entry left by 05-7. You see, it's actually knowing what happens to you after death that makes SCP-2718 happen. If you spend your life believing in a version of the afterlife, only to then learn about SCP-2718, then that information will override whatever religion, culture, or faith led you to believe about death. Knowing about SCP-2718 overwrites your afterlife. It creates a new, endless, and meaningless pain as you experience every sensation beyond your death. Decay, decomposition, cremation. That's the reason that belief is the key. Because once you are exposed to it, SCP-2718 becomes what happens after you die. In our defense, we warned you. Sometimes the SCP Foundation needs to get creative with how they go about securing, containing, and protecting. Sadly, not everything can be solved with the Mobile Task Force or by locking it away securely in a concrete chamber. Which brings us to SCP-2480, otherwise known by the nickname an unfinished ritual. When initially looking through the file on SCP-2480, the reader will immediately notice a number of discrepancies throughout. Parts of the entry have been crossed out. They've been struck through, so they are still readable, not redacted completely for the purposes of secrecy like many of the details in other SCP files. First and foremost, SCP-2480 has been reclassified multiple times, first as safe, then changed to the infamous Keter class, but now it is listed as far more ominous, presumed neutralized. It's disconcerting, because presumed definitely leaves a lot of questions. So what exactly is SCP-2480? SCP-2480 is an area of dimensional abnormality, apparently created when an occult ritual was interrupted in November of 1952 hence the nickname of an unfinished ritual. The source of this anomaly is located in a heavily forested town somewhere near the coast of Massachusetts. Of course, this state has long been synonymous with many occult happenings, Massachusetts famously being home to a number of supposedly haunted houses and sites of supernatural activity. And SCP-2480 is no exception, seeming to fit both of those criteria. In order to keep an eye on SCP-2480, the Foundation has dispatched Mobile Task Force Epsilon-6, mm -hmm. also codenamed the Village Idiots. These operatives are working undercover in the surrounding area and nearby town, keeping watch for any sightings of anomalous activity. Meanwhile, another team, MTF Psi-9 The Abyss Gazers, are stationed nearby in case any incidents should arise. These operatives have been authorized by the SCP Foundation to employ the use of lethal force on any and all anomalous manifestations they should encounter. Their directive is to destroy without prejudice. That sure sounds like a lot of effort to secure something classed as presumed neutralized. The anomaly itself is centered around an old Massachusetts house known as Bodfell Manor. The manor was once the home of a millionaire industrialist by the name of Cornelius P. Bodfell III, who died in 1952 at the age of 86. And yes, he died in the same year that the ritual that created SCP-2480 took place. But we're sure that's probably just a coincidence. Right. Interestingly, during his life, Cornelius Bodfeld apparently had something of a fascination with the occult. It was likely this interest that drew him to creating a supernatural cult known as Adidium's Wake. Little is known about this organization, and Adidium's Wake are not part of the SCP Foundation's groups of interest, the list of other anomalous groups that often rival the Foundation. Much like the anomaly itself, 
they're presumed neutralized. The Foundation conducted a full-scale investigation into Bodfeld Manor and were able to unearth more information about the aforementioned cult. Fortunately, Cornelius Bodfeld kept a series of meticulous and detailed journals, as well as photographs that give plenty of insight into the activities of Adidium's wake. Unfortunately, a lot of what they got up to wasn't all that pleasant. But what did you expect from a group of cultists? Adidium's wake would engage in all kinds of depraved behavior, some that's better left to the imagination. What we can say is they'd often perform ritualistic human sacrifice and indulge in cannibalism. And these are some of their less unpleasant crimes. On-site personnel also uncovered sermon notes in Bodfell's journals, detailing the cult services and occult practices. They also found lists of the Adidium's Wake members, including local wealthy families and respected politicians, other industrialists like Cornelius Bodfell, and even priests and other religious figures. The Foundation had previously been aware of Adidium's Wake, but initially dismissed the group as little more than a decadent upper-class social club not worthy of a full investigation. Let's review, shall we? We have a dimensional anomaly in a Massachusetts manor, a cult obsessed with the supernatural, and some sort of ritual that occurred in November 1952, but was interrupted before its completion. All parts of the same bizarre and twisted puzzle, but there's still a piece yet to be uncovered. That missing piece? The Global Occult Coalition. Who would have expected the GOC to rear their ugly heads around here? Though it's worth mentioning that many of the GOC's member groups are occult in nature, so it probably shouldn't come much as a surprise that they were somehow involved in this case, too. It goes without saying that the SCP Foundation shares a complicated relationship with this particular group of interest, each often disagreeing with the other's methods. Occasionally, the GOC and the SCP Foundation will put aside their differences and act as allies against large-scale threats like the Scarlet King, but any alliance between them is often uneasy and short-lived. In the case of SCP-2480, the Foundation were first alerted to the anomaly's existence when they decoded a GOC distress signal, tracing its source to Bodfell Manor. When the investigative team arrived, they found deceased bodies littered throughout the estate, 36 corpses in total. Each of these were confirmed to be Coalition operatives, and the rest were theorized to be dead members of Adidium's wake. Almost all of the corpses found at Bodfell Manor displayed signs of anomalous causes of death. Some had imploded, some disintegrated, and others had their bodies twisted into fatal new shapes. At first glance, and given the GOC's mission to destroy the supernatural, it looked as if they had stormed in and interrupted the Adidium's Wake cult while they were right in the middle of performing a ritual. Things went awry, SCP-2480 was created, and caused everyone nearby to die horrifically. Surely that's the whole story, right? Well, not quite, as it turns out. While there were no surviving GOC operatives for the Foundation to interrogate, the investigative team were unable to uncover documents related to the operation in a nearby safe house used by the GOC. Much of the official documentation was destroyed in an attempted cover-up, but a torn remainder of a mission report was recovered in the safe house's fireplace. It was actually the Global Occult Coalition who had initiated the ritual, though its true purpose was lost. The Foundation had learned that the SCP-2480 area had been inadvertently created by the GOC and their heavy-handed approach to their mission. But why would an anti-occult organization attempt a supernatural ritual? Theories as to their intention seem to point to the penultimate piece of the puzzle, Sarcasism, a widespread religious cult that worships flesh and disease. The very existence of this religion is viewed as a threat of apocalyptic proportions by the SCP Foundation. Sarcasism was initially founded by the Grand Carcist Ion, but it has since split into a number of smaller subgroups over the millennia, and among those groups, a Didium's Wake. The GOC mission report fragment gathered by the Foundation describes the operative's target to be Grand Carcist Ion himself. He apparently cannot be directly perceived, so few actual descriptions of his form exist. It has been noted by some to be humanoid in appearance at least, wearing what looks to be vestments similar to a priest's and carrying a staff. Ion is able to disappear and reappear at will, and possesses a plethora of reality-altering capabilities. The Sarkic founder is able to shift and reshape any organic material, as well as having the ability to bend the very fabric of reality around him. While he may hold a humanoid shape, this entity is certainly not human. 
at least not any longer. Functionally immortal, Grand Carcist Ion is noted to frequently exhibit signs of malignant narcissism and megalomania. So now the story shifts. The GOC was attempting to use a Didium's wake to summon Ion in order for them to eradicate the leader of the Sarkic religion. The plan backfired though. SCP-2480 was summoned, and both the cult and coalition operatives were killed. End of story, right? Except there is one more twist in this tale of cults and secrets. And that twist came from the last place anyone would expect. It came from inside the SCP Foundation. After SCP-2480 was created by the ritual at Bodfell Manor, Site-13 was established in order to keep the anomalous area contained. You see, if the ritual was an atomic blast, then SCP-2480 was both the crater and the nuclear fallout from that blast. Except instead of causing radiation sickness, the entire area around Bodfell Manor became dimensionally unstable and prone to anomalous occurrences. Overseeing Site-13 was Director Simon Oswalt, a Foundation bureaucrat. Simon had been selected for this duty thanks to his distinct lack of imagination, and because the anomalous area of SCP-2480 was thought to be inconsequential at the time. In 1988, Oswalt failed to deliver his regular report on SCP-2480's activity. This was initially thought to be a simple error, except the Foundation couldn't get in contact with Site-13. Why? Because the unfinished ritual hadn't actually failed. It wasn't unfinished. The GOC had succeeded in summoning Grand Carcist Ion, and Simon Oswald had been the one to discover this. The founder of Sarcasism appeared to Oswald, who was converted and turned against his superiors at the SCP Foundation. Ion was able to exert his influence over the former bureaucrat, swaying him to change sides by showing Oswald a description in the Foundation's personnel dossier on him that referred to him as a mirthless dullard. Turning his back on the Foundation and pledging himself to Sarcasism, Simon Oswald was granted anomalous abilities by Grand Carcist Ion. Oswald was given the power to control an army of anomalous entities called Sarkites that he could summon through the area of SCP-2480. Grand Carcist Ion dubbed Simon with a new name, Carcist Carvas, and made him the leader of his new army. Their goal was to bring about the Sarkic religion's ideal, the dawn of a new age of flesh that would spell destruction for humanity. When the Foundation lost contact with Site-13, they dispatched two agents to investigate, Samuel Rowe and Sarah Valentine. Unaware of Oswald's conversion to Sarkicism and his new purpose as Carcist Carvas, both agents were captured by the Sarkite creatures within SCP-2480. The same monsters were also terrorizing the nearby town, replacing citizens, and sometimes even kidnapping and devouring them. Another team was later sent in to survey the area, only to be killed or replaced as well, with only one survivor, Dr. Kalitsto Narvaez. Narvaez reported on the situation to the O5 Council, and in collaboration with the Global Occult Coalition, the Foundation launched an assault against Oswald. The joint task force of the two organizations were able to neutralize the Sarkites, reclaiming the area of SCP-2480 and capturing Simon Oswald. Without his control, the creatures became directionless, unable to so much as eat or defend themselves. Grand Carcist Ion's plan had been thwarted, and Oswald was taken back to an SCP Foundation site, though now under a new name. SCP-2480-1. However, during an operation at Containment Area 14, Oswald seemed to suffer no effects from anesthetic or surgical incision. Foundation researchers were horrified to learn that Oswald no longer possessed any internal organs, save for his brain, heart, and lungs. The rest of him was empty. Later, he was interrogated and began raving about Grand Carcist Ion so much that the doctor questioning Oswald attempted to attack him. Breaking free of his restraints, Simon Oswald amputated both of the doctor's arms before he was recontained by guards. Since then, the area of SCP-2480 has been mostly quiet, but it still remains under the Foundation's close watch, just in case any anomalous happenings start up again. But if you're planning a tour of the many haunted old houses of Massachusetts, we'd recommend maybe avoiding Bodfell Manor, just to be safe. Thousands lay dead across the globe face twisted into a twitching rictus grin. Their corpses are found by their families, their friends, and law enforcement, but nobody has a clue what could possibly have killed them all. 
a serial killer, a mysterious new disease, or possibly even a supernatural monster. In all of this, who could possibly expect a rogue meme? Before we uncover the secrets of SCP-3078, the Foundation would like to clarify its position on the classification of cognito hazards. You may have seen the title of this video and worried that we might be telling you all about an anomaly involving literal excrement. But don't worry, this is merely the result of a precaution we've taken to ensure that there is no breach of a standard procedure involving cognitohazardous materials. To quote the father of modern toxicology, Paracelius, poison is in everything, and nothing is without poison. The dosage makes it either a poison or a remedy. The Foundation has categorized many types of cognito hazards, but we are not the only organization with rules and regulations regarding such things. To put it another way, there are certain words and phrases that the YouTube platform deems cognito hazardous and must, therefore, be avoided, lest the Foundation risk its own funding in the name of accuracy. We hope that you understand as we proceed. With that out of the way, let us move on to the menacing mimetic macro itself. SCP-3078, the cognito hazardous poop post. It's 3 a.m. and you're scrolling through social media, checking on the latest gossip and discourse while making the rounds to all of the usual places where you get your funnies. In your late night search, you stumble upon a meme that hits your brain in exactly the wrong way. The joke isn't even that funny, but somehow, you begin to laugh uncontrollably. What was it that caused you to lose your grip? Was it the tiredness you were feeling? The doldrums of seeing so many unwholesome opinions before encountering the image? Or maybe something about the meme was so poorly constructed that it crossed the line twice and looped back around to being hilarious? You're not sure. And in fact, as you continue to crack up, you become even less sure of what it is that you are laughing at. You try to stop yourself. But the involuntary response continues. Your sides begin to hurt and you double over as tears begin to stream down your cheeks. You cover your face and try to bite against the insides of your mouth, but there is no stopping the giggle train. The giggle train keeps on rolling through, and your chattering teeth nearly bite too hard. You stop because of the pain and continue to laugh loudly. Under ordinary circumstances, you might worry about waking someone up at this late hour. But as you recall, you are completely alone in the house tonight. There is nobody who would be disturbed by your seemingly endless burst of laughter, but that only makes what comes next all the more horrifying. By now, your vision is hazy from all the tears of laughter. You can't even see the offending image that broke your composure. And now the situation is starting to feel inexplicable. That's when you realize you can no longer inhale. The uncontrollable laughing has removed your ability to breathe. If it continues like this, you will meet an untimely fate through suffocation. You are totally alone and unable to call for help as all the spasms of laughter cause you to fall out of your chair. You writhe on the ground, crying and laughing and not even capable of gasping for breath. Your life is fading away, all because of a meme that made you laugh yourself to death. Fortunately, this is not actually you, but it could have been if you had been so lucky as to come across an instance of SCP-3078. Unlike most of the unfunny and low-effort memes that never make it to truly iconic status, this particular strain of image can have devastating effects on those who witness it, and that's no laughing matter. This is because despite its apparent poor quality as a post, the humor response it generates is anomalous in nature, and in every recorded case of exposure, quite deadly. To date, SCP-3078 has claimed the lives of 3,576 civilians and two members of Foundation personnel. Discovered in the untamed Wild West of the Internet, SCP-3078 is a self-replicating image that can appear without warning on message boards and social media platforms capable of hosting media. In many ways, it is like any other meme that is proliferated through the World Wide Web, with the slight distinction that it doesn't originate from a human source. For every single instance of SCP-3078, an anonymous profile is created simultaneously with the post on the corresponding platform. While any of these profiles cannot be traced back to any existing IP address, there is a predictable quality as to when new ones will spawn, though not where. Every hour that an instance of SCP-3078 exists on the internet, a duplicate of the meme will emerge on another website posted under a new profile. 
The profiles associated with SCP-3078 share a similar pattern in that the given username will invariably be a random arrangement of the numbers 69 and 420. If these references fly over your head, you are obviously new to the internet. The most that you need to know is that these numbers are automatically funny, and the more that they are used as punchlines, the funnier they become. In much the same way as the <clears throat> poop posts they are connected to, 69 and 420 are memes designed to induce outrageous laughter in those who witness them. When tags and hashtags are applied to SCP-3078 instances, the number 420 is often included, as well as the phrases, don't do weed, and meme. These are more coded phrases from the internet, meant to evoke a universal comedy. The phrase, don't do weed, in particular, hints at a connection to a group of interest whom we will soon discuss. Back to the duplication and generation of the images, there have been theories that SCP-3078 is connected in some way to the activities of a group of interests known as Gamers Against Weed. The radical faction of video gaming enthusiasts is known for proliferating the dankest of anomalies throughout the world, and several of these have been contained by the SCP Foundation. You are probably familiar with SCP-3108, the nerfing gun, which reduces any object or living organism to a worse state. That powerful weapon is a Gamers Against Weed original, and it is hardly the only SCP that these rising upstarts have seemingly brought into existence. Most of the other SCPs created by Gamers Against Weed interact with media and images. This includes SCP-2293, which modified pre-existing stories to include a new line of dialogue at pivotal moments. The line of dialogue in question will always be, did you know that world-renowned author Stephen King was once hit by a car? Just something to consider. While initially meant as a harmless joke between members of the group of interest, the mimetic phrase quickly spiraled out of the gamer's control and began to spread to every corner of the media landscape. Incidents such as these prove that Gamers Against Weed has a track record of creating anomalies that may appear harmless but cause untold destruction in their wake. They may not be an outwardly malicious group of interest, but the problems they cause have serious consequences. If the cognitohazardous poop posts of SCP-3078 do originate from within the organization, it is believed that the image was created by a member whose online handle is HarmPit. Regardless, the post and its duplicates have long since taken on a life of their own. This duplication process that occurs hourly while an instance of SCP-3078 exists is what is known as an SCP-3078 Connert event. In order to prevent the spread of SCP-3078 images, every instance of the post must be deleted to prevent a Connert event from occurring. For this purpose, a team of Foundation hackers and highly trained meme experts have been assigned to patrol the web for any instances of SCP-3078 and remove them immediately. While this unnamed unit is crucial to saving lives and keeping your browser safe from cognitohazardous material, it would not be accurate to refer to them as a mobile task force, since they are entirely sedentary in their work. But even without a proper designation, our anomalous hackers have been outfitted with the latest processing systems and can also accomplish all their intended tasks from the comfort of their top-of-the-line gamer chairs. Also, cognito hazard detecting software and augmented reality glasses allow our hackers to safely interact with SCP-3078 without having to use the naked eye. In this way, they are safe by avoiding the memes laughter-causing anomalous properties. When it comes to busting bad memes, the Foundation hackers are the professionals. Of course, our staff is only able to curtail the number of exposure cases. There seems to be no known way to reverse the erratic laughter that results from seeing an instance of SCP-3078. The only thing worse than a bad viral meme is a bad viral meme that kills like a virus, too. Additionally, because memes tend to be shared in groups and among friends, every instance of SCP-3078 has an indirect knock-on effect that creates a cycle of exposure. While these mass death events caused by SCP-3078 are usually reported as gas leaks or bizarre cult rituals, the truth on the scene is often far more gruesome than one might expect. For example, before SCP-3078 was cleared from the internet, there was a particularly horrifying event that resulted from an instance accidentally being inserted into a slideshow at a company retreat for a major marketing firm. 
The second the image appeared on screen, an entire room full of executives, specialists, and interns burst into an uproar that continued onward with no indication of stopping. Security footage of the event shows many of the business associates trying to calm themselves before looking around and realizing that everyone in the room was also laughing. The contagious fits of laughter did not stop, and things soon became distressing. The instance of SCP-3078 was not on screen for most of the duration of the crowd's laughter, but when it had appeared, the text on the top of the image read, When you inhale the devil's Mary Jane smoke, a humorous and trendy reference to weed. The bottom of the macro featured a distorted emoji with deep-fried text that read, Oh no. Using a Wayback Machine on the confiscated laptop that displayed the image revealed that over the course of the laughing outburst, the upper text began to change. Twenty minutes after the laughter had begun, the image read, It wasn't supposed to be on the slide, oh my god, this is embarrassing, please stop laughing everyone. Forty minutes later, the text on the SCP-3078 instance changed to, No, 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 why can't it stop, this isn't normal, I'm losing my mind, I'm losing it, I'm losing it. One hour and thirty-five minutes later, the entire room had completely lost consciousness, and yet the image changed again to read, It's over. It's over. We can't go on like this. I never should have clicked that link. Ha 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 that meme got be dead bro. The next and supposedly permanent change caused the text to become the letters X and D, next to each other in a text emoji that repeated thirty-four times across the instance. There were no survivors, and when the authorities arrived in the conference room, they were alarmed to find that the victims of SCP-3078 were still laughing and smiling, even though they had already expired by suffocation. Somehow, the anomalous properties that compelled laughter from those who viewed the cognito hazard persisted after all the air had already left their lungs. Raspy noises of sharp breath forced their way out of the respiratory system and larynx of everyone in the room. Because of the continued laughter of the corpses, medical practitioners were instructed to make attempts to save the patients post-exposure. There was nothing that could be done, and in a grisly image that still haunts the dreams of some Foundation staff, the morgue of the hospital that attempted to care for the SCP-3078 victims was stuffed with bodies that were still laughing, even while in their cold lockers. Amnestics were administered to everyone involved in the mass exposure event, and efforts to wipe out all SCP-3078 images were redoubled. In accordance with damages done, agents of the Foundation were dispatched to track down members of Gamers Against Weed for comment and possible assistance, compelled if necessary. It may not surprise you to hear that many of the GAW-aligned hackers who were caught and contained during these proceedings were pressed into service as conscripted hackers for the Foundation's ongoing web presence. Ever since the year 2017, all known instances of SCP-3078 have been successfully neutralized. Long-term containment is not deemed possible due to the potential of another image being posted at any time. But when such a time does arise, our teams will be ready to delete the instance within the hour to prevent an SCP-3078 Connert event. Of course, in the years since, there was never a direct admission of guilt on the part of Gamers Against Weed, or a promise to cease their activities as a group of interest, but the Foundation has been monitoring the gamers ever since. The frightening thing about SCP-3078 isn't so much its deadly consequences, but the fact that it can spread so quickly if unattended. The internet is a very big and very strange place, where any number of unusual things can happen. Sure, this cognito hazard was neutralized, but what other mimetic nightmares are lurking in isolated forums that most people who use the internet have never so much as laid eyes upon? In the ocean of data that has existed since the information age, there are dark trenches where anomalies fester and grow stronger, without the supervision of responsible adults. Like the ancient and omnivalent Cthulhu from the cosmic horror works of author H.P. Lovecraft, there are visions of madness that mere normies are not meant to see. The worst of them remain the objects of worship for select groups of withdrawn hermits, many of whom will live their lives in darkness, never endeavoring to feel the light of the sun or place their soft, uncalloused hands upon blades of grass. SCP-3078 may have been detected on the surface of the internet, but only after it spread to major social media platforms. Its discovery and neutralization sets a benchmark for how to handle similar threats, but it would be naive to assume that the next killer meme will be as determined to make us laugh.
It bears mentioning that another Gamers Against Weed SCP, SCP-5273, is the designation given to a kind of text and image post that can create irrational anger in those who observe it. If a similar anomaly were to arise that combined the worst elements of SCP-3078 with SCP-5273, there is a possibility that a cognitohazard meme could be created that drives the viewer into a murderous rage. While purely theoretical, the Foundation remains prepared for anything. By their very nature, cognitohazards are weapons against the mind, and because of this, only the truly twisted tend towards creating them or using them consistently. Even an entirely sane creator of a cognitohazard may find themselves corrupted by what they have done and come to regret ever attempting to change others' minds in the first place. So remember, with or without anomalous properties, memes are serious business and not to be trifled with. Without a proper understanding of the power of memes, a simple harmless idea can spread on its own and become an unintended source of mass suffering. Know your memes, fear your memes, respect your memes. Death, that terrible and inevitable consequence of life. But as the Foundation discovered in the aftermath of Project Amorong, its absence can be even more horrifying than its presence. Let's bring you up to speed, shall we? Here's the story so far. After the death of Overseer 05-11, the SCP Foundation's infamous O5 Council learned the horrifying truth of what happens to human beings after death. There is no afterlife, no everlasting paradise or eternal damnation. Instead, the dead are cursed to remain conscious, aware of everything happening to them after passing, even their bodies decomposing. To combat this, a member of the Council, 05-4, established Project Emerong. This was an internal Foundation-backed endeavor, created with one singular goal in mind, to capture and contain death itself. As part of this project, researchers created the machine known as SCP-3448. At first, it seemed like just an ordinary MRI machine from a hospital. SCP-3448 had a number of anomalous modifications made to it giving it a rather unique function. The device was capable of separating someone's consciousness from their body, putting them in a sort of half-dead state. While in this state, a subject placed within the machine, referred to as SCP-3448-A, could maintain a consistent line of two-way communication between their disembodied consciousness and the Foundation. Instead of deploying a member of D-Class personnel, one of the SCP Foundation's own agents was placed into SCP-3448. Agent Anthony Michaels was elected to act as SCP-3448-A and serve as the conduit between the living world and the endless nothing that lies beyond. But as often happens when people dabble with forces they cannot possibly understand, something went awry. Project Amarong's mission to contain death took an unexpected turn. When Agent Michaels was placed into the machine, things ended up getting much, much worse. Buckle up, because we're about to dive into the ill-fated outcome of the death-defying Project Demerang, the catalyst for the end of death itself. One of the components connected to SCP-3448 is a monitor. This screen is used to interpret the electrical activity of SCP-3448-A's brain once they have entered the half-death state known as SCP-3448-1. This component of the anomalous MRI machine is able to intake these electrical signals and interpret them as images, occasionally with words accompanying them too. During his time in the machine, Agent Michael's brainwaves were able to deliver some rather interesting imagery to the Foundation researchers. A number of these seemed to be a bizarre and seemingly disconnected series of images, almost like something taken directly out of a dream hard to find any real context for. The first was a human figure, surrounded by a swarm of buzzing insects. After 43 minutes, the monitor connected to SCP-3448 showed this figure looking swollen as if it had been stung by the insects, which flew away as the obscured humanoid collapsed. The next day, the screen showed a man lying alone in a desert somewhere, with an oasis in the distance. Almost like the classic mirage, someone dying of thirst sees just out of reach as they stumble through the endless sand dunes. 
The same day, the image changed to a man in a fetal position, in a room made of dirt with bones and roots protruding from the walls. So far, the dreamlike images coming through from Agent Michael's half-dead mind look strange, almost like the contents of the infamous videotape from the horror movie The Ring. Did any of these images mean anything? And if so, what? Was the man, the human-shaped figure appearing in them, Agent Michaels himself, or some kind of representation of his disembodied consciousness? Now that it had been separated from him by the SCP-3448 machine, one of the Foundation's researchers described the imagery seen on the monitor as being akin to watching someone's acid trip for over a week. However, the same researcher also theorized that because Agent Michaels was being held in a half-dead state, that the other things appearing in the images with him could also be similarly half-dead. The researcher believed that what they were seeing was more of an abstract, conceptual representation of death, not a conventional afterlife, like the idea of walking up to the pearly gates or the fire and brimstone of hell. So the researcher decided to try half-killing objects, partially disassembling things and placing them into SCP-3448 with Agent Michaels. Sure enough, doing this meant that the man in the images now had whatever object was put into the machine. For example, when they broke apart a lighter, it appeared in the man's possession on screen. Unfortunately, this was the biggest mistake that the researcher could have made. The images on the monitor began to show the man, now believed to be Agent Anthony Michaels, being attacked by a little girl. Thought to be a manifestation of the very concept of death, this girl was seen stabbing the agent with a femur, torturing him while the Foundation were sat watching, powerless and unable to help. The researcher requisitioned a handgun, partially disassembling it like the lighter in order to arm Agent Michaels against his attacker. And it worked. But the consequences were unfathomable. Sure enough, Michaels was able to draw the firearm and fend off his attacker. The agent fired off a shot that, over the course of more bizarre, creepy, and disjointed images involving skeletons and teddy bears, seemed to hit the girl square in the head. The image that followed showed Agent Michaels standing alone in a garden, flowers blooming as dead insects rained down around him. On the ground beside the agent was a stuffed animal, a crow with a bullet hole through its head. Shortly after, the following words appeared on the monitor attached to SCP-3448. I hope you enjoy your hike, Dad. For a few short moments, nothing seemed to be all that different to the Foundation and the outside world. The researcher who had provided Agent Michaels with the handgun was trapped in a state of shock for a brief while, until five minutes later when the phone calls started flooding in. The first came from Joyce, a woman known to the researcher who frantically explained how her father, who had been dying, now was totally fine all of a sudden. The researcher couldn't quite tell if she was happy or terrified by what seemed to be happening. Next came the orders from above. The Overseer, 05-4, the only council member aware of Project Demerung and who had backed it financially, called to congratulate the researcher and the rest of the team behind the project. It seemed that Demerung had been successful in the goal they had set out with, to contain the cognito hazard known as death. 05-4 demanded that all records and information regarding the project was to be incinerated, covered up from the rest of the Foundation's knowledge. But the truth was far, far worse than any at the Foundation realized. It soon dawned on the researcher, who had been documenting Agent Michael's time in SCP-3448, that Project Damarong had not succeeded at all. They hadn't contained anything, hadn't secured the conceptual form of death. What they had done instead, by foolish mistake, was neutralize death. They had killed death itself, and now the world as they knew it was gone, changed almost indefinitely. Now not a single person in the world could die. They had caused the end of death. On the surface, a world without death sounds like a utopia, a blissful society where everyone on Earth lives a long and prosperous life. But those with a little more foresight will know that peaceful immortality for the human race is a fool's dream. Think about how many people there are living in the world right now. The overall global population grows exponentially every year. While death might be a sad and somber part of life, it is unfortunately necessary. Even with all the deaths that occur worldwide every year, the resources of planet Earth are still being stretched thin. Water, oil, 
Food, electricity, homes, everywhere you go, there are plenty of people who don't have enough of any. So what happens when people don't die, just keep aging infinitely? What happens when the Earth becomes too overcrowded, when the number of people overshadows the number of resources even more than it already does? Society as we know it, across the globe, would collapse. And that's exactly what happened. The Foundation had done the unthinkable. They had vanquished the very concept that takes us from being alive to being deceased. But there's a reason Kilroy J. Oldster called death the great equalizer of human beings. It is meant to catch up with everyone. Every person born is ultimately destined to die. And by removing that element of human mortality from the equation, the SCP Foundation had unknowingly pushed the world towards disaster. With the actions of Agent Michaels within SCP-3448, death as a concept ceased to exist almost instantaneously, as if someone had flipped an off switch. People didn't become undead. Things that had long since passed away and been confined to six feet under the dirt didn't start clawing their way back up to the surface. We aren't talking about a zombie outbreak. This isn't Dawn of the Dead. Instead, human beings across the world just refuse to die. Their brains continuing to function and bodies continuing to age, despite any damage or injuries they sustained. Fatal wounds were now just as dangerous as getting a broken ankle or sprained wrist. The concerns about how undying humans were overpopulating the planet were also extended to animals too, which were also affected by the end of death that Project Demerung had triggered. As a result, the threat of starvation on a potentially global scale was greater than such a concern ever had been. Of course, the SCP Foundation left the concerns of a potential humanitarian crisis to those in charge of world governments. The United Nations could worry themselves over how to feed and care for a population that simply won't die. The Foundation had bigger fish to fry. Their mistake had caused this situation, so only they could undo it. The only solution they could come up with? Figuring out new ways of killing people. The Foundation wanted to bring death back to the dead. Their experiments began with the use of D-Class personnel, commanding them to attempt to kill one another through various means. Strangulation, both by hand or with the use of a belt, didn't seem to work the way it should have, with the D-Class being strangled, likely going into a coma due to a lack of oxygen to their brain. Not dying, but living in unconscious agony. In a similar experiment, placing a D-Class in a vacuum led to burst blood vessels, impaired motor functions, widespread paralysis to name a few forms of damage. But still, death could not be achieved. Cutting, blood loss, poisoning, starvation, shooting, even decapitation of multiple D-Class personnel all yielded the same result. In some sense, simply allowing these subjects to die might have just been kinder, if death was still possible, that is. The Foundation even went as far as removing the brain of a live monkey, placing it in a blender, and testing to see if there was any electrical activity present. And wouldn't you know, it was somehow still alive. At least as far as life can be measured by human beings. This key part of our existence, the underlying fact of death itself, was no more. Removing that was like taking a crucial element out of a circuit. The world just didn't function in the way it was supposed to anymore. What hope did the Foundation have now? What could possibly be done to solve this colossal mistake? Well, the answer is very little, apart from waiting for the inevitable collapse of society. What awaited was a world in ruin, where everyone was starving but nobody could die. A planet and a people, just hanging on until the universe eventually blinked out of existence so that maybe then they could rest in peace. The moral of the story? You can't cheat death, because death isn't the other player. It's the game itself. Now go check out Secret Group That Runs the World, SCP-05 Council Explained, and SCP-006 Fountain of Youth for more videos about attempts to cheat death and its not-so-pleasant consequences.